One in the first quarter, Mizzou just threw an interception. Brad Smith's second interception of that game will keep you updated throughout the evening. Coming up at 7.45 Eastern Time, a battle of SEC East co-leaders, Tennessee and Georgia in Rocky Top. Heather Cox caught up with Georgia head coach Mark Richt. Coach Richt, this week you told me that the game against Tennessee two years ago was a defining game for this program. Now you play clearly for a shot at the SEC championship. How important is this game in relation to the win two years ago? Well, two years ago was big, no doubt. We were just uh, wondering if we were good enough to beat anybody in this league. And, and now we got a chance to uh, take the lead in the East. Um, it's just huge for both teams. If Tennessee wins it, uh, we'd have to hope for them to lose twice, and I don't think that's going to happen. The game is just moments away. Describe the look that you see in the players' eyes, the feel that you have in the locker room as you guys get set to take the field in one of the most intimidating and imposing environments in all of America. Well, I think they're ready. They've... Uh, been real quiet all day and usually that's a good sign for us and uh, it's been a long day at the hotel waiting for it but uh, I believe the guys will be ready to go. Coach best of luck the Georgia Bulldogs have won three in a row tonight they hope to make it four. ESPN 2's college football Saturday brought to you by Old Navy Painters Pants they'll work for you and by Chick Quattro Four blades and two conditioning strips for an incredibly close shave. Georgia Bulldogs have won three straight in their series against Tennessee. They've never once won four in a row. They'll try to do that tonight in Rocky Top. Let's send you out to Knoxville. Matt, thanks. 105,000 people and a couple of hungry canines are ready for this one one of the premier matchups in the southeastern conference and indeed the last few years in the country at neyland stadium tonight espn 2 prime time college football separation saturday winding up with a great one 10th rank four and one georgia visiting 14th rank four and one tennessee these are the last two one loss teams remaining in the east and all but one year the winner of this division had no more than one defeat. Welcome to Knoxville. Dave Barnett and Bill Curry. And for all of you who are proponents of a playoff system in college football, basically that is what we have tonight because the winner, in essence, will have won a playoff for the SEC East Championship. You folks want a playoff? You got a playoff. And it happens in the regular season. And only college football can say that the significance of college football's regular season has been so much enhanced by the BCS and this game is a perfect example here you have the two dominant teams in the Southeastern Conference East and tonight is essentially an elimination game for the BCS a lot at stake it doesn't get any better than this in the SEC day down on the sidelines with us tonight let's welcome Heather Cox Dave, thanks so much. Many believe that tonight Tennessee's Casey Clawson faces the defining moment of his career as he tries to avoid becoming the Tennessee quarterback that went 0-3 against Georgia. Well, he hasn't made it very easy on himself, giving Georgia a bit of bulletin board material. Last year, Clawson didn't play in this game because of a fractured collarbone. Well, Georgia took offense when he was quoted as saying he could have led the ball to a victory with just one arm. Casey knows it. He's feeling that additional pressure to right the wrong. And he has a major fan in his coach, Philip Fulmer. So this is probably the toughest quarterback he's ever had in his 12 years at Tennessee. Second winningest coach in the country by percentage, eight and three against the Dogs. Mark Richt in his third year at Georgia, the SEC Coach of the Year last year. He delivered Georgia's first conference championship in two decades. And the last two meetings, Rick versus Fulmer, have been memorable. Tennessee has won the toss and elected to defer. And James Wilhoit has us underway. And a good deep kick. They're going to bring it out, though. Greg Gibson, not much on the return. Just 17 yards. And the Bulldogs will start back up near their own goal. This is the junior quarterback from Snellville, Georgia, David Green. He's a road warrior. He's won here. He's won at Bryant-Denny Stadium, at Jordan-Hare Stadium. He's the SEC Offensive Player of the Year from a year ago, and he was the championship game MVP.
105,000 plus roaring in his ears. Green will take the game's first snap with three wide outs on the left side. Out of the shotgun, and it gives to Tyson Brown and hit immediately. Harris Harrelson, the first to arrive for the Volunteers in our Bud Light starting lineups. You've already seen Fred Gibson with the opening kickoff. He is a potentially dominating player who made his first catch here two years ago as a college player. Just about ran away from the field that day and might just do it tonight. A loss of seven on a handoff. Second down at 17 in Tennessee showing blitz. This give up to the middle for Browning. We'll get maybe a couple back. Browning bringing up third and long. Georgia starts four sophomore offensive linemen. They named him a redshirt freshman. Very young, promising up front, though. Second group is equally young. They have no one older than a sophomore, in fact, in their first two units of the offensive line. Andre Dickerson has got to come through and be a leader for this young defensive line of Tennessee. Two wideouts. And again, it's Browning on third and 14. Georgia goes nowhere with the game's opening kickoff. Tennessee wishing they had played that spirited against the Auburn running game last week. The linebackers, a couple of Kevins on the outside, Simon and Burnett, pieces in the middle. And in the secondary, Greer, Baker, Wilson, and Allen. By Tennessee standards, this is not a strong group. Seventh in the SEC. And as we said, Auburn just straight them in the running game a week ago. Gordon Ely Kelso with a very high short kick and fair caught by James Banks. And the Volunteers, after just a 28 yard punt, are going to start off in tremendous shape. Wilmer's offense takes it to the 42 yard line of Georgia. 4 0 until the loss at Auburn last week, a game in which they rushed for a grand total of four yards. Break it down, it was .25 yards per carry. Bill, that's nine inches per <laughs> carry allowed by the yeah. Auburn defense. That's not very funny, but you have to chuckle when you hear a number like that. You don't hear that number very often at all associated with Tennessee. They've worked on that all week. Tony Brown goes in motion. His play is to give to Cedric Houston. One of those running backs stifled in Auburn last week. The junior from Clarendon, Arkansas. Third leading rusher in the SEC. And Derek White among those to get there for the Georgia defense. Gain of five. And three wides on second down at five. Clawson with a change at the line. Senior quarterback, Northridge, California, did not play in the last meeting. Again, to give to Houston. This time, nothing up the middle. And the balls will look at third and still about five. Clawson, a surfer from California. So he wanted to go where football is king. And did he ever find the right place? Nickname has been pretty much from day one here. Iceman, not just because he's a cool customer, but because he looks remarkably like Val Kilmer, the Iceman. <laughs> from uh, the Top Gun movie a few years back. They say Houston actually lost a yard at third and six. And to the air for the first time. That one intended for Banks, who didn't turn around in time. Lost it under through it. And both offenses limited to three and out on their first possession. So Tennessee does nothing with that terrific gift of field position. Philip Palmer is a Tennessee devotee of field position, the kicking game, and he knows that his team, his offense, just squandered a wonderful opportunity. The odds on scoring some points when you get the ball inside the 50-yard line are extremely good. Dustin Colquitt is extremely good. Tops in the country at net punting. Phenomenal 
44 yards plus. This one notwithstanding, though, they're going to mark this out. At the 19, he gets only 18 yards on this one. So Georgia will have it for the second time when we come back to Knoxville. Georgia will start at its 20-yard line after an 18-yard shank by Dustin Fulton. And the Tennessee defense acquitted itself well first time Georgia had it. A little worse field position even than this. David Green, 25 and 6 in his career. Georgia as a starting quarterback, including 9 and 1 on the opponent's home field. His only loss earlier this season at LSU. The play kick over the middle and a nice catch in traffic by Fred Gibson. A first down again at 13 yards. Let's send it down to Heather. Dave, as you mentioned, Tennessee has struggled to run the ball, but they've also struggled stopping the run. Two staples of the former era in Knoxville. In last week's loss to Auburn, the Vols managed to gain just four yards on the ground. And in the last three games, Tennessee's averaged just two and a half yards per carry. It hasn't been much better on the other side of the ball. Last week in the loss to Auburn, the Vols gave up 264 yards on the ground. And ironically, Georgia has allowed just one rushing TD this season. Got to Back on the ground and Browning cuts back, looks for some room, and does well to get about three yards out of that. So it's just numbers, Bill, that you just don't associate with a Tennessee defense. No, you also don't associate the big guys up front getting knocked in the backfield the way they do right here. Boom, look right there, the center's reaching over. He gets knocked backwards. Gracious. No place to run. Good job by the Tennessee front. Last week, they couldn't get that done. Russ Tanner, number 50, the center, reached over and Mondre Dickerson and got a mouth full of Rydell. As in helmet. Timeout. As Green comes to the line. Ten minutes, 11 seconds just underway. Knoxville, Tennessee. Georgia and Tennessee for East Supremacy in the Southeastern Conference. Olive Garden. When you're here, your family. Just a perfect night in Knoxville. Rained last night. It's been uh, sunny as it's dried out today. On the 70 degree mark, couldn't be better for football. Hard to get a better matchup than this. And after the timeout, a couple of pump fakes as Green throws complete to his tight end Ben Watson, senior Rock Hill, South Carolina. The strongest bulldog ever. As in the history of the program, they've never had anybody bench press 565 as Watson did long, long ago. And he's been out most of this year, so the Bulldog people will be really happy to see him. Tennessee people will be really happy to see that run defense as tough as it was on the first play Georgia attempted in this drive. It is enough for the first down. And from their own 43, Georgia again, Green trying to be heard at the line. Good luck. Give out of the gun. Browning cuts back and met hard at midfield by Rashad Baker. Came up from free safety. It's very clear right now that Georgia's plan is to come out and exploit the young front people of Tennessee. They don't run the ball with the same kind of style or the same kind of plays as Auburn, and they certainly don't have the same kind of bat. Tyson Browning is about one-third the size of Cadillac Williams, but he is effective. He's quick, the darter. Browning getting his initial start. Has been sharing some time with Fred Lumpkin, Michael Cooper, his job tonight. Green does well to get off any kind of pass. Under the pressure applied by Mondre Dickerson, the defensive tackle. And third and three now for the Bulldogs. On Separation Saturday, someone will separate itself from the rest of the SEC East. The first year, the SEC split into divisions. Two losses won the East. That's the only time that's happened. Last year, Georgia became the first team besides Florida or Tennessee to win the SEC East, and they're trying to repeat it this year. But a conference loss already at LSU. Tennessee dropped its first last week at Auburn. A third and three green incomplete intended 
for Reggie Brown. Damien Gary also in the neighborhood. Tennessee gets a stop at midfield. A very sobering thing for Georgia's coaching staff and team. Fred Gibson, number 82, is not on the field. They had four wide receivers on the field. That does not augur well because it's been a hamstring, and I've never seen a hamstring that got completely well during a season. Gibson already out of the game, at least temporarily. If you're Georgia, you have to hope it's very temporary. Healy Kelso has basically been impossible to return against. Five returns, a total of 16 yards by the team Georgia's played the first five weeks. 36-yarder, not returnable here. Baker with a fair catch. Let's go down to Heather. Dave, as Coach just mentioned, Fred Gibson does have a gimpy hamstring, but what he did is he just injured his knee on the last series. He's got a knee bruise. They do expect him to go back into the game, but now not only hamstered by that hammy, but also the knee. Not uncommon when one muscle is injured or one part of your body is injured, you get injured somewhere else because you're trying to protect the hamstring, you put extra stress on your knee, and you get a series of injuries, and we hope that's not the case here. Fred Gibson... Well at the top of the Georgia all-time receiving list. Major loss if he doesn't get to play all night, every snap. Cedric Houston gets about eight yards. Let's check in in the studio with Matt White. Uh, guys, when you haven't beaten a team in 25 years, you might as well try some stuff. Brad Smith to Darius Outlaw on what appears to be a bubble screen, but Outlaw, recruited as a quarterback, throws it right back to Brad Smith. 47 yards on the touchdown catch in Mizzou up on Nebraska. Well, that's trying some stuff. Second down run by Houston. We'll have the first down across the 25-yard line. Now let's check the Tennessee lineup. You see Clawson, the senior quarterback, in just about every stat there is. He's ahead of everyone in Tennessee history except Peyton Manning. And the rest of the Tennessee Bud Light offensive starters. This is a receiving group. Jones, Brown, their backups, including James Banks, that Phil Fulmer thinks can eventually be as talented as you expect the group of Tennessee receivers to have. Fumble and recovered by Georgia. Kendrick Golston, the defensive tackle with the game's first takeaway, and the Dogs have it at the 24. I think the most important aspect of football is ball security. This ball's waving around. That's how it gets knocked out by Gerald Anderson, number 92, who's penetrating, knifing into the backfield. The first big break created by the Bulldog defense in this football game. The opportunistic Georgia defense at work again. And a plus for them. They're tied for first in the league. Plus six turnovers for the year now for Georgia. And he got out of the gun. He gives to Browning. Flag is down. Browning, two cutbacks, and down inside the five. It's going to come back. Somebody getting their hands outside the plane of the body in there. There's going to be a holding call. The crowd here will love it. Mark Rick, not so happy about it. I've saw a gain of... 20 yards. Our referee tonight is Penn Wagers. He'll have the call. So instead of Browning first and goal at the five, this one will be marked. Holding on the offense. Ten-yard penalty. Now remains one. At the 34. Which you have, in essence, a 29-yard penalty. Those things are devastating. They're drive killers, and they make such a difference. When you get an opportunity like this, you really must cash in. Playing on the road, trying to take the crowd out of it, they're right back in it. The crowd noticing Green with the audible so they get even louder. First carry, Michael Cooper ended the 28-yard line for the redshirt freshman from Sylvania, Georgia. He didn't play at all last week with a sprained knee, but before that, he started the South Carolina game. He's their leading rusher for the year, 290 yards, nearly six for carry. 
You can forget about verbal communication with anybody outside the guards when you're playing in this stadium. This is a sophisticated crowd. You must have hand signals, and that's how Green's getting the plays to his receivers and his tight ends. Balls like don't bother the audible, it just encourages him. And a short talk to Watson, the tight end, and they'll mark him out at the 26. So just a short gain of a couple. Watson, the only senior starter on this Bulldog offense. Robert Peace, middle linebacker number 41, is going to blitz a lot tonight. You could just sense it being with the coaches right in Green's face, forces the quick throw. Green's on the mark, but it was a short game. Third and 12. Georgia trying not to waste the gift of a recovered fumble deep in volunteer territory. They come after him with a blitz. It's picked up. And Green firing the long out. It is caught by Damian Gary, a yard shy of the first out. He gets 11 yards. Two beautiful football things happened on that play. First of all, here comes Tennessee with an all-out blitz. Georgia picks it up to perfection. Watch this. Boom. Everybody blocked. Everybody forming a wall so that Green has a chance to do the second beautiful thing, which is an absolutely perfect throw. So that his man's the only guy that has a chance to make the catch, that being Damian Gary. Beautiful execution. And on comes the senior kicker, Billy Bennett. From 32 yards out, and he is good. Bennett, one of the top kickers in Georgia history. In fact, the all-time SEC kick scoring record a year ago. First team all-conference at our 12 out of 17 for the year. So Georgia gets three off the game's first turnover. Separation Saturday, Georgia and Tennessee. Battling for first place in the Eastern Division of the SEC. Under a full moon. So we might be in for some weird wacky stuff tonight, huh? Uh, it's always weird around here. I'm talking about southeastern big-time football games. When somebody's getting ready to be eliminated, things get weird. And it sounds weird to say that on October 11th, but that is what we have here within the history of this division. Two losses, you're out. The loser tonight will have two conference losses. And a very weird decision here to receive that kick as close as Corey, Corey Larkins was to the sideline. There was absolutely nothing good that could have come from that. Well, I'll tell you, Tennessee's coaching staff, Phil Former, such a Bob Nealon guy. On the play. They practice this stuff. Listen the here, official. Carrier had the ball across the line, sideline. Therefore, it's a kick out of bounds. Wow. Corey yeah. Larkins is bailed out big time. Okay, Corey can turn around and salute the moon or something. <laughs> the fakes, Mother Nature, because he just got bailed out, and he's getting chewed out anyhow. <laughs> Phillips going to get on him anyhow. I'm not sure he was out of bounds, but that was the call. I think his toe was. The rule says if the ball goes out of bounds, you're going to get it at the 35-yard line. That I actually watched Tennessee practice those situations yesterday on the practice field. I'm sorry, day before yesterday. Thursday's practice, you try to cover everything. Tennessee's very thorough, much like Virginia Tech in the kicking game, and they practice that stuff. That's why Coach Fulmer is so upset. If you don't practice it, it's the coach's fault. If you do practice it, it's player's responsibility. Well, it's about a 25-yard break. Tennessee starting from his 35. Jabari Davis will take this series of tailback. Junior Stone Mountain, Georgia. He takes the toss. It's about four yards out of it. Bud Light offensive line lining up this way for Tennessee. And as everybody knows, the center is the most important guy on the field. No exception here. Scott Wells, the most consistent offensive lineman for Tennessee, blocks really well on the run. I really like him. Georgia's defensive line. Anderson getting a start for Veal. Anderson played very well last week. But Pollock is the guy you want to watch at all times, capable of making any play. 
a defensive lineman can make. Consensus All-America, SEC Defensive Player of the Year as a sophomore last year. And a fascinating character. That, too. Number 47 lined up at the left defensive end. Cross into the air. And it's caught. Jason Swain, first down yardage to the 46-yard line. Jason, true freshman. One of a pack of Tennessee receivers. He's from Huntsville, Alabama. Linebacker core, Derek White, sophomore, getting a start for Tony Taylor at the weak side spot. Taylor battling an ankle he hurt against the LSU in the first quarter. Thomas Davis, a dominating defensive player all over the field. You'll have fun watching it. Well, Tennessee on the eye again on first down. Flag is down. Davis fouls forward. Some pretty good power behind him. Six feet, 225. Second leading rusher. It's across midfield, and we'll wait for Penn Wager's call. It is against Tennessee. We send it back to Matt Weiner. All right, Dave, let's check in on the Pac-10. Arizona on a 13-game home conference losing streak. But Chris Hefner trying to change that. Finds a wide open Byron to Eli, 39 yards, 21-10 cats. Speculation continues over who will be uh, eventually named Arizona head. Not enough in on the line of scrimmage for the offense. Five-yard penalty. First and 15. One of those speculated, Bill, is the possible head coach of Arizona didn't hurt his cause too much today in the Cotton Bowl. That would be the uh, Oklahoma defensive coordinator of the Stoops draft. Oh, I think not. Oh, man. He didn't hurt himself. You got that right. Strapped Texas. Lawson. Plenty of time and almost intercepted. Arnold Harrison. Leaped, got a hand on it, couldn't bring it down. Arnold Harrison, number 46, has quietly had himself a very good night. He's made hits in this game. We hadn't had a chance to discuss it because we were in the midst of giving you lineups. Beautiful job of getting his hand up, showing a good vertical jump, and tipping that one away. So second down at 15. split backs this time. Lawson stepping up after feeling the pressure and wide open and gone is C.J. Payton. 59 yards. A flag back at the line of scrimmage. And Bill obviously a major Georgia defensive breakdown in the secondary. Major indeed. Something between Sean Jones, the rover, and Bruce Thornton, the left corner. Holding on the offense. Penalty of 10 yards. Now remains second. See if it's not in this Munoz Pollock matchup. A very clear trend in this game is both offenses shooting themselves not only in the foot but all over the place. Pollock pushed to the ground. A little takedown there. It must have been the call. That happens on every play, but the officials are right on it, and they saw something they didn't like. Yeah, he's looking right at it. Did you see anything that uh, deserved the flag? Well, I didn't. You could be technical and say he pushed him in the back, but that's not what they call. They wipe out a 59-yard touchdown to C.J. Payton and make it second and 25. Tennessee back at his 31 now. And the short toss complete to Mark Jones, two-way player. We see some of uh, Mark Jones, the defensive back as well today, as well as on special teams. The Corey Bryant racked him up immediately, third and 20 coming. We have talked at some length about the youth up front for both of these squads. Now, these are two veteran players in the secondary for Georgia who absolutely busted the coverage. Bruce Thornton, Sean Jones, simply, whether it was too deep, then it should have been Sean Jones. If it were a man, then it should have been Bruce Thornton. I don't know what the call was, but somebody should have been running with Peyton. Here's third and 20 for Clawson. 
And another flag down. Cedric Houston hit immediately with the screen at the 38-yard line, and there's a flag over there as well. First indication, this will be against Georgia. Offside on the defense, penalty is five yards. Down remains three. Well, Tennessee gets the break and another shot at converting another third and long. Now Brick, two years ago, got uh, his first dose of what it's like to coach here. Pulled out one of the most memorable victories in recent years for Georgia. In the final seconds, again, there was one and lost and won again in the final minute. Not anything like that tonight. And uh, separation Saturday will come to a memorable close. 3 nothing right now, Georgia. Loss of a third and 15. Throw on the run, and the uh, receiver tried to stop and adjust, but Mark Jones would never have gotten to that one, thrown way out of bounds. But what we're seeing so far is a patient defensive approach by both defensive coordinators, John Chavis for Tennessee, Brian Van Gorder for Georgia with occasional all-out pressure. Both offenses have adjusted, picked up the pressure well. There have been some passes hit, but one mistake after another has kept both teams out of the end zone. Look for somebody to eliminate the mistakes and start moving the ball and getting it in the end zone. I don't know which team it'll be. Damian Gary drops back. He's 14 yards away from the all-time Georgia punt return career record. Much better effort here by Colford. Gary gets about half what he needed for the career mark. On a 42-yard kick. Well, the first place Seattle Seahawks, led by rushing sensation, former SEC star Sean Alexander and their tough defense, have been one of the early surprises in the NFL. Tomorrow night, they welcome Carol Owens and the San Francisco 49ers to the Emerald City. 49ers Seahawks, Sunday night football, 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. And available nationwide on ESPN HD. It all starts with NFL primetime presented by Miller Lite at 7.30 Eastern. Talking about these mistakes, Dave, made by... Oh. Kicking team player went out of bounds on his own, came back in. The penalty is declined. Now, that's another full moon call. You can go a whole season and everything. <laughs> well, I just run down this sideline here, run behind the water bucket, and then come back on the field. There's a rule against that. That's not quite a full moon. Do we still get just well, as weird a plays? For our purposes, it is so far. Yeah. We're, we're going to count it. You got it. Dogs from the 26th play fake, and Green is buried. He looked up, and Jason Hall was inside his jersey. A sack, a loss of 11. Jason Hall, number 94, once again fulfilling what his coaches want. And there's been, there's been pressure on Green all night long. As a rule, he handles it well, but he can't handle all of it by himself. This is a blitz. All right, there's Robert Peace, number 41, the middle linebacker, blitzing again. The last time was just a rush from the front four. Green for Jason, sophomore from Marietta, Georgia. Second and 21. Green, much better protected now. And his throw for Brownie is complete and out near the 30-yard line. The market of the 28 and a gain of 14. Kevin Burnett, junior outside linebacker, recruited with Casey Clawson from Carson, California. Casey from Northridge. And both of them came down to Tennessee or Colorado. They both picked Knoxville. Academic All-SEC last year, Kevin Burnett, has his sports management degree. And he's got two seasons worth of eligibility left, but already a graduate. And he can run like the wind. <laughs> ACL last year, you never know. Green again under pressure. Browning with the screen set up nicely. He has a first down out of bounds at the 40. I check in with Matt Weiner. 
All right, Dave, a veritable offensive explosion by Notre Dame standards. Julius Jones having himself the night against that Pittsburgh defense. He's up around 140 on the ground. This 39-yard run set up a field goal, and the Irish lead by six in the third. The Irish long overdue to have something good happen to them this year. You know, when we first looked at this slate of great games for October 11th, that at one time looked as good as any. Notre Dame Pittsburgh going on on ESPN. They're close, so are we. Three nothing dogs. A little over two minutes to go. First quarter. This is Michael Cooper. And off tackle to the 45 and a half yard line. In our open, we talked about the fact that this is a playoff atmosphere, and that's what we're seeing. As this game wears on, the mistakes should become less and less. The team that is better prepared should eliminate the early nerve nerves. We've seen nerves from both offenses. Too many mistakes early. Let's see who can settle down and mount a drive. On the eye this time, play fake, something green is excellent at. Jeremy Thomas, not bad at this. Pass catching fullback, rams his way up to the 35 of Tennessee, 19 yards. Now, when we say Ben Watson can bench 565, he can also squat about 650. That's number 89 right here. He's coming back and woe to poor old Robert Peace who's just trying to do his job and he gets what's called a deep pleader there. He knocks down two of them. And Jeremy Thomas gets to handle the ball. That's fun for fullback. Green will keep. I don't know if that was a play and draw. <laughs> now that's one of those OG and he turned on that 495 and turned it into a nice game. That away, David. David, go back to the huddle. Now, let me throw that thing most of the time. One of the things the Tennessee staff was most impressed of when they were talking about David Green is his play action ability. They said there's, there's almost no way to tell their run from their play action because the way Green carries them out, they look exactly the same. That time the fake turns into the quarterback keeper and now Cooper tries to get the corner turn for the first down and where they mark him he'll have it at the 24. David Green was a grown up the day he set foot on the SEC field. He proved it right here two years ago. Now in his junior year he's being criticized because he tends to get a lot of balls tipped. So we did a study of his release. Look where that thing is. It's up above his ear hole on his on his helmet. The ball's a nice high release, so the tipped balls are not because David Green throws the ball down at shoulder level. You want your quarterback to release the ball as high as possible and still get a natural throwing motion. David has a nice motion. He had 10 balls tipped at LSU in a game that they lost. And basically, when you study that tape, the LSU guys just did a great job of getting their hands up. Well, if you're worried, if you're a Georgia fan and you're worried about Green and interceptions, remember this. He has the second lowest interception rate in SEC history for his career. Only Peyton Manning's was lower. But we're, we're talking about something else here. You get a lot of tip balls. That's not the same as interceptions. A lot of times they are intercepted, but we haven't seen it here tonight. It'd be interesting to follow that as the game progresses. Also got bothered by drops at LSU, five of them, which uh, together you add them up, make three fatal. Green, another play fit. And this one juggled and dropped by Jamario Smith, the backup fullback. College game day final. Final wrap up of all today's actions. Highlights coming up at midnight Eastern with Reese, Trev, and Mark, nine Pacific, here in the studio for college game day final. I don't know how they're going to possibly sum up everything from all the matchups today on Separation Saturday, but they will find a way. 42 seconds in the quarter. Ninth snap on the drive coming with three wides on the left side for Green. And again, well protected. Short toss over the middle. At the 20, it's Michael Johnson. I know David Green was reading his keys there, but Lord have mercy. <laughs> Reggie Brown, number one, was out there in a bunch. Tennessee had a, 
a coverage that was a man short. Georgia had him outnumbered, and Reggie standing alone in the left flat, and David Green never saw him. Clock winding down in the first quarter with four wides now, a diamond pattern, and third and seven. Bubble screen out there goes to Browning. And he cuts it back to the 12-yard line and a Georgia first down in the last play of the quarter. And you find yourself wondering, how can a 165-pound guy get on a field with all these monsters? Just think of Warwick Dunn. Think of Warwick Dunn with the Atlanta Falcons now. Reggie Brown doing a good job of blocking out there for his man and good running by Tyson. Georgia trying to win its fourth in a row over Tennessee, something that's never happened with a 3-0 lead in a feisty first quarter at Neyland Stadium. As many Georgia fans as could pack their way in along with Uga in the Neyland Stadium. SEC East first place at stake. Winner will have it. Winner will all but clinch. And we say that just because only once has a two-loss team ever won the East. Both coaching staffs approaching this as the SEC East championship game. Georgia up 3 nothing and driving as we begin the second quarter. And Tyson Browning, sophomore tailback out of Watkinville, Georgia, is to the 11-yard line. Our Xerox game track through the first quarter. Georgia had the ball twice as many snaps. David Green spent some time on the dirt. When he was able to get his passes off, though, he was 9 out of 12. The one turnover fumbled by Cedric Houston. And now second down and eight for the dogs. He wide right side. Green with the fade. And the over-the-shoulder catch by Johnson. Corner of the end zone. Touchdown, Georgia. Absolutely amazing work by the quarterback, David Green. The center absolutely turns his man loose, and he's right in. J.T. Mapu is right in the quarterback's face. This is a blown pickup by Russ Tanner and his mates. <laughs> Beautiful by Green. Billy Bennett makes it 10-0 Georgia. First touchdown of the year, senior from Tulsa, Michael Johnson. Another look. Another look from a different angle. Look at Mapu right just clean in the quarterback's face. And how do you step into that and make a perfect over-the-shoulder throw to Michael Johnson, reminiscent of the winning throw at Auburn two years ago, or one year ago, less than a year ago. I'll get it here in a second. Wasn't long ago that he did that at Auburn. It was back there a little yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. Fourth and 19, I think. This guy can play. Johnson quiets. So I found Knoxville. That is not easy to do. Tennessee's had the ball only 11 snaps, 31 total yards in the first quarter. Dave, we have an answer to the very first part of what I posed a moment ago. The playoff atmosphere, mistakes by both offenses. Somebody's going to settle down and have a drive where Georgia's done it. They took the ball down the field. They overcame a penalty, made first downs, got it in the end zone, and that's the indication that they are now ready to play at playoff level. Let's see if Tennessee can match them. Time of possession is just about exactly double in favor of Georgia. Championship teams answer when they're scored upon. Tennessee's offense will be called upon to answer what Georgia's offense has done here. That's what we're looking for. So Bennett ready to kick, senior from Athens. And he just went up down to the four. Tennessee's return by Gerald Riggs with a late flag he is out to the 27-yard line. See what the flag's about after we check in with Matt Weiner. 
All right, Dave, wild afternoon in the MAC. Kent State and Marshall, a 49-27 game. Look at Joshua Cribbs to Nadja Pruden. And there he goes, 97 yards. 49-33, it wasn't enough for Kent State. Marshall wins it. Meanwhile, UCLA and Arizona get you updated there on the Pac-10. Bruins back on the board. Manuel White, five-yard touchdown run. UCLA now within four. Holding on the receiving team during the return. Ten-yard penalty. First down, Tennessee. Tennessee did not need to add to their trouble. Already behind 10-0 with that holding penalty. They'll start to even deeper in their own end. Just across the 10. Boston just two of five, 11 yards in the first quarter. Wasn't on the field long enough to get anything established. And now Boston. In the Georgia end of the stadium, that end zone where most of the Georgia fans are, he's trying to be heard. Jabari Davis is caught for no gain. When you see that, Bill, just have to remember back one week to how thoroughly Auburn dominated the Tennessee ground game, holding him to just four total yards rushing. And, and you know David Pollock is an All-American. You know he's going to be a factor. He's unblocked here. That's inexcusable for the offensive line to lead 47 on the run. He's going to hit you in the backfield. He's not going to miss. He hasn't got that many sacks yet. Only credit he did a half sack, but he's gotten very close a number of times. Clawson going deep. And the battle for the ball is won by Jones. Mark Jones took it away and takes it all the way. 90 yards. Great players in big games make great plays. This is an underthrown ball, an easy interception, right? Wrong. To Corey Bryant, number 22, has the ball snatched from his hands by a great player, Mark Jones. James Wilhoyt adds the extra point. With that ball in midair, I just conceded that to DeCorey Bryant. No way that ball's not intercepted. Mark Jones with other ideas. He wins a jump ball, and 90 yards later, Tennessee is on the board. Jones on the receiving end of the longest pass play in Tennessee history. By six yards, it's the longest. Previous record was an 84-yarder, Andy Kelly to Anthony Morgan against Arkansas in the 1990 Cotton Bowl. 90 here. Lawson to Jones. 10-7, Georgia. Lawson to Bryant to Jones. <laughs> Kick down to the five. And Fred Lumpkin, a true freshman, on the 20 yard return. Look at it again. How did Jones keep this from being a pick by DeCorey Bryant? You've heard of Tinkers to Evers to Chance. If we can stop this right here, you'll see that Jones has got DeCorey Bryant beaten right this minute, right out there. He's, it's all over. The ball is very poorly thrown. DeCorey Bryant's going to intercept it. So it's Lawson to Bryant to Jones. Separation Saturday indeed. Ronnie Clefetting is separated from the pack. Reggie Brown with the catch, close to the first down. <laughs> that was a literal separation that just happened there. Boy, you talk about one play that completely changes the outlook of 105,000 people. That one did it. Oh, yeah, when you study Tennessee's roster, the thing that hits you right in the face is that these guys are from all over the country. Now, here's a Pennsylvania kid. He's a senior. 
he hadn't gotten a whole lot of attention, but you watch him practice. He's one of the great athletes on the field among many great athletes. He plays defense. He's outstanding on kicking teams. And he just answered my question in that he answered the University of Georgia's touchdown drive in one fell swoop. His only four starts before this year were all as a defensive back. The former Pennsylvania High School Player of the Year from Wallingford. And again, the longest pass play in the long crowd history Tennessee football. We just saw it, 90 yards. So Georgia still with the lead, but they had just handed over the momentum. And it's a 10-7 game with a second and inches. Fullback Jamario Smith easily picking up the first out to the 38. Jimmy Harrell, number 92, a young defensive tackle, getting his first action for Tennessee, is already well schooled. And what, what they're trying to do to David Green is to get the hands up right here. He's blocked at the line of scrimmage. But look at him, Lee. Try to tip the ball. It's a pretty standard procedure by defensive line coaches, but they're hoping to tip some balls on Green. Play action. And on target again for Jamario Smith. Walk on. Former linebacker. Georgia 10-7. Now we've got a game. It is on. Oh, we got a football game. And, and you study tapes. These, John Chavis, the defensive coordinator for Tennessee, has really worked with these young defensive linemen to get those hands up and try to tip balls because David Green tends to get a little rattled when that happens. So we'll see as the game progresses whether they're able to have any success. LSU probably won the game largely because they tipped 10 of David Green's passes. Fullback in a workout. This time it's Jeremy Thomas. Thomas, the third straight starting fullback Georgia's had that's a former walk-on transfer. Thomas began at Air Force Academy. Mario Smith began at Gordon College where they did not even have a football program. He walked on to Georgia. And this in backfield with Tyson Browning. And they have it at midfield, another Bulldog first down. And the give is to Browning out of the shotgun. Caught for a loss of a couple. Middle linebacker Robert Peace. And Joe Raymond Peace, his dad, a longtime good football coach down at Louisiana Tech. So Robert grew up in a football family. He understands about middle linebackers filling those gaps. And he, he beat the scoop block of the center, Russ Tanner, and uh, met the play behind the line of scrimmage. Loss of three, they call it. Second down 13. Well, again, any time Green moves to change the play, the decibel is just about double. Everybody heard this one correctly, and it is caught by Damian Geary. Close to a trap, but he holds that one into the 45 of Tennessee. Geary showing what is probably the best part of his game, the sure, consistent hand. Wow, nice catch. And you saw those defensive linemen's hands up in the air. Again, this is pretty standard. Tennessee really hoping to get some tip balls that very often turn into interceptions. Really hoping now to get a stop and get it back into the hands of their offense. This is only had it 13 plays. This is the 31st snap for the Georgia offense. And there's plenty of time, but no first down. And that is not a fumble. Then Watson down and then caught it up, but he's a yard shy of the first down marker. No, that, that's not a fumble, but that was Watson being just a little bit too cool. Jabril Wilson and Jason Allen right there on the spot. He was just tossing the ball, but you need to hang on to that ball. Don't even give the officials a chance to make a mistake. And Georgia moves it pretty well, but the drive now uh, bogged down, and so Ely Kelso will try a placement kick somewhere inside the 10-yard line. He's been good at that. Almost half his punts have been killed inside the 20. Again, he's only had five returned all year. This one may have a little too much on it, though. It will bounce into the end zone. 
So Georgia will uh, net only 21 out of that. And Tennessee, under the watchful eye of Michael Munoz's father, maybe the best tackle in history, Anthony Munoz. We'll hear from him when we come back. Brought to you by Best Buy. Thousands of possibilities. Get yours. And by McDonald's. Anthony Munoz enjoyed a Hall of Fame career as an offensive tackle for the Cincinnati Bengals. Now you're able to enjoy watching your son Michael play. He goes up against one of the best ends in the country, and David Lewis. What kind of advice were you able to give him? Well, the main thing, you know, we, uh, we talk a lot about technique. And with Pollock's quickness, I said, you know, you can't watch his head. Just uh, keep your head back and uh, use your hands. You know, he's, he's quick. He's got some good strength. But he's, he's not one of the bigger guys that you'll see in the uh, you know, Division One. But he's got some good power. And so those are the type of things we talk about. It's just, you know, I try not to clutter his mind with too much. But just a uh, thing here or there. Speaking of that, I talked to Michael yesterday. And he said he learned from you watching your success how to handle the pressures. How did you keep that healthy perspective and, and teach it to him? Well, I think, uh, you know, with a lot of the friends we had that helped keep us grounded. I mean, football is important, but I think Michael has gotten a really good perspective that you can go out and work really hard as a football player, but it's your life that you really have to be committed to and do well in. And those are the things that he really has got a grasp of and that we're proud of him because, you know, he'll give it 100% out here, but he's really concerned about what he does off the field. I mean, he's graduating in three and a half years. We're thrilled that that's happening. He's married, he's a newlywed, and that's going really well. So he seems to be taking care of all the other things off the field. Certainly impressed with them, and we enjoyed watching you play as well. We'll let you get back to this series. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, all right, uh, try and put aside your forest bred prejudices. <laughs> Did you ever see a better tackle than Anthony Moodle? Uh, let me think about that a second. Forrest was pretty good. Bob Vogel was pretty good. Jim Parker was pretty good. Last catch by Troy Fleming. Setting up third down, and this one is dropped. And Jason Swain was ready to turn that one up, maybe get some big yardage out of it. No. I did not see a better right. tackle than Munoz. Very he, honest answer. I had an op opportunity because Jim McNally, his line coach, was my buddy when he was at Cincinnati, and Dick LeBeau was my buddy. I got a chance to sort of do a clinic when he was in about his second year, and he filled up the hotel room. He was already bigger than most of the guys playing in the mid-70s, and he had such great feet and such a great attitude. And you heard what kind of dad he is right there, what his value system is, and that's what makes him great. He's certainly among the, the all-time best. Took the hang time of Polk with the nation's second leading punter, just a tenth of a yard away from having the best figure in the country. Damian Gary reversing field and out across the 45 before his return will finally end. And it is a big return. The hang time was superb, 4.8 seconds. 49 on the kick, 16 on the return. And forget midnight tonight. Wrap up all of Separation Saturday's results. College game day final. All the highlights from this uh, afternoon and evening with Reese Trev and Mark in the studio. Nine Pacific on ESPN. So Mark Rick, Georgia, up 10-7, midway second quarter. More good field position. They start at their own 47-yard line. They have outgained the balls 154, 120, and 90 of that for Tennessee on one play. This is Michael Cooper. Picks up about eight yards. Back to the studio on Matt Weiner. Well, Dave, Julius Jones is running roughshod over the Fighting Irish. 2014 game. Jones off left tackle. And there he goes, 61 yards. He's up in the two teams at the moment in rushing yards. They missed the field goal here, so they still lead it 2014. Best day of the year by Notre Dame on the road so far over on ESPN. Cooper again. He just needed a couple. And he got stuff for no game. It'll be third and two. So far, what we've seen from George is they've been able to get the corner in their outside running. They've got some nice misdirection outside runs, but they really haven't knocked these young players and their leader, Mondre Dickerson, who is a senior number 90, have been able to knock them around the way Auburn did.
Georgia with all that movement. Daniel Inman fires off the line too soon. Prior to the snap, false start, offense, five yards, down remains third. Now this is a sophisticated movement called Yaz by many people, Y and Z moving all the way over. And what, what, what Georgia managed to do was to confuse its own lineman, Daniel Inman. Georgia now has three penalties for 20 yards, all of them drive stoppers if this one causes this drive to end. Over the middle, wide open, Watson. And he hangs on despite a big hit from Rashad Baker, 18 yards. They convert the third and seven, and Baker limps off. Rashad Baker's a big stick. He's been hitting people hard ever since he got here. He's an all-SEC player. Looks like he got dinged a little bit there, and you run into this big tight end, and you've got to tackle him, and you tackle him hard, and that's nice technique, but, man, it's like running into an outhouse, a brick outhouse. Here's to the fullback, Jeremy Thomas. You, you could have found some other mental image than that. Could you? A big brick outhouse, a two-holer. You just run right into that thing head first, and it just knocks you goofy. So you're staying with that? Staying with the outhouse? I've got no choice. All right. Well, they have a, a real weapon in Ben Watson. And not everybody uses the tight end this day and age. In fact, Tennessee has not completed a pass to a tight end all year. Georgia, with this first team all SEC senior, their only starting senior on offense, he's had a nice first half for him. Breaking a couple of tackles is Tyson Browning, 100 pounds or so lighter than Ben Watson. Effective in his own way. He's to the 25. Georgia will have another third and three. And we have Mark Jones on the defensive side now. We've there seen he what is. he can do on offense. There a 90-yard touchdown pass. Good play some nickel and some dime situations. But you got to understand, and people from my generation said, yeah, I played both ways, too. You played both ways against other people that were playing both ways. This guy's playing against people that are only playing one way. gets it off in time flags and there must have been a whistle before that snap not that we could hear it up here regardless of what happens here what we're seeing is prior to the prior snap to the delay of game offense five yard penalty well what we just saw was the fourth call the fourth penalty on Georgia. This time, David Green trying to call timeout. Could not quite get it done in time. <laughs> He's got the football. This isn't basketball, David. <laughs> you don't catch the ball and call timeout. And you get drilled when you do that. Let's see if Tennessee feels the ears back again and comes after him. Greens, Browning, not off his feet, a solid open field tackle by Constantine Ritzman, senior defensive end from Berlin, Germany. David Green had trouble against LSU because he was hit constantly. Balls were tipped, mistakes were made, more of the same tonight. He's got people in his face, but he's still productive. So this will be a 44-yard field goal attempt for Billy Bennett. 12 of 17 with his hit earlier tonight. Plenty a leg, and he has drilled it. Now that is really significant because Bennett had been almost perfect prior to the LSU game, went to LSU and missed three field goals easily within his range, which cost Georgia points that was, would have been enough to win the football game, basically. And what's significant there is, in the only regular season games that Mark Rick's dogs have lost, Bennett has missed at least two field goal attempts in all five. Well, tonight he's two for two, and it's Georgia by that March.
That sums it all up, doesn't it? Battle for first in the SEC East. Georgia's won three straight. They've never won four straight against Tennessee. And that followed a streak of nine straight wins by the Volunteers. Last two classics. Total of seven points decided them. 18-13 and 26-24. Bulldog wins. 13-7 now after Bennett's second field goal. It's another one very close to the sideline before Gerald Riggs decides to run it out. And not a good decision goal. Here comes the flag at the end of the 10-yard return. I'm going to say this again. This is a team that practices these situations on Thursday. Here's the call. Block in the back. If you hit the guy below the waist, it's called a clip. If you hit him above the waist in the back, it's called a block in the back. They used to just be all blocks in the back. He's not sure what to do. He's a very young player, Gerald Riggs, terribly talented. Doesn't look much like his dad right now, but he will in time. Let's see. I, I'm not yet. Well, I guess I better. And here I go. And then he goes across the field, which makes it easy for Georgia to nail him at the 10-yard line and the penalty half the distance, and they start with 95 yards ahead of him. And I think where he went across the field, he got as far away from his head coach as he could have. <laughs> That's the smartest thing he's done in the last minute. So from their own five, Clawson out of his end zone, and the pattern on the sideline will be to James Banks should be enough for a first down. Late second quarter, Georgia by two Billy Bennett field goals leads this one 13 to 7 to the only points for Tennessee scored on the longest pass play in the history of volunteer football. 90 yards, Casey Clawson to Mark Jones. That's 90 of Tennessee's 120 total yards, now 130 total yards so their other 16 snaps have totaled 40 continuous contact to the head on the defensive team penalties 15 yards touchdown fifth penalty against Georgia really gets Tennessee out of that deep hole near their own end zone but without the lightning flash of that 90 yard catch and run by Jones Mark Rick defense has just completely dominated Tennessee. And from that standpoint, it's looking a lot like what Auburn did to him last year, at least in the running game. Clawson had a terrific day through the air. He's really been on the field long enough to get much of a rhythm established here tonight. That's Chris Hannon's first catch. He was their leading receiver last week. Five catches, 95, and a touchdown. Crossing through for 355. There is no magic about being an All-American. It doesn't always go to the most talented. It usually goes to the most relentless. Watch 47, David Pollock. Absolutely constant motion. Never resting. Always after the football. From the walk. About a foot to go here. Watson will keep slide. First down to the 43. Might have a late hit. John Jones, the rover. But this is the first consistent drive that we're seeing from Tennessee. And the balls are getting tremendous help from the University of Georgia. And Brian Van Gorder is furious with Sean Jones. And you could say, well, he really couldn't help After himself, play, but he really could. Foul, late hit. Because this guy's a marvelous athlete. He can dive over the offensive player. And that quarterback slides with his feet first you are not allowed to hit him he is down all you got to do is fly over you don't have to drop that elbow and try to pop him upside his head Sean knows exactly what he's doing and so does coach Van Gorder and here they are coming off their five yard line with their first real drive of the evening courtesy of the Bulldogs forty two of the Bulldogs Lawson at the play kick. Another couple of markers are down. James Banks has the catch. 20 yards down to the 22 of Georgia. Well, that one's going to come back because Michael Munoz is getting it on with David Pollock, and this is going to be a fascinating battle, and we'll keep track of it for you. 
He's done a very nice job of protecting Pollock, keeping him out of the play. Holding on the offense, 10-yard penalty from the previous spot. Repeat the down. Now, a play it goes, speaking of battle. That's uh, Georgia defensive coordinator Brian Van Gorder coaching up Sean Jones about that penalty. Yeah, he's coaching him up vigorously. <laughs> Van Gorder, one of the better defensive coordinators in America. Very intense. Shared by his players. Last year, a finalist for the Royals Award, which goes to the top assistant coach in the country. He had the SEC's top defense a year ago. Plus, and again, forced to scramble and throw it away. Two marvelous young linemen like Bulls taking each other on, just smashing. This time, Munoz forgot and thought he was in a wrestling match. Michael, you can't pin him. You can't take him by the shoulders and reverse him onto his back without getting a flag, and that's what happened. What are the chances we'll see that matchup continue on Sundays for the next few years? Unless they get to the same team. <laughs> I'm sure they both left there. At least a year away, both juniors. With all SEC talents. A lot of fun to watch him go head to head tonight. Second and 20, screen set up for the fullback, Troy Fleming. And let's see what Matt has coming up for us at the half. Well, Dave, a severe storm blew through Tallahassee this afternoon, which had nothing to do with weather. Lee Corso and Kirk Herbstreit will check in to weigh in on Miami's big win, plus the Sooners' Texas massacre here on Separation Saturday. Plus, Pittsburgh having trouble keeping up with Julius Jones, who's closing in on a University of Notre Dame record and possibly a big upset. All coming up on the Pontiac High Performance Halftime Report. All right, and that is Thomas Davis, the uh, outstanding sophomore free safety for Georgia. Face down over there on the Georgia sideline with the Tennessee timeout. Michael Munoz with his hands full. One of the flaws in the shotgun offense is there's no snap count. So Pollock is actually off the ball before Munoz. And had that not been a screen, he would have been to the quarterback before the quarterback had a chance to set up and deliver. The gun is snapped at the center's discretion. When the quarterback's underneath the center, then there is a snap count, and the offensive lineman has a distinct advantage. And the gun, both have to look at the ball. It's really tough on the offensive tackles. Well, both free safeties having problems now. Davis getting tended to, and Tennessee's safety, Rashad Baker, with a quad bruise, headed to the locker room where they will evaluate him and decide whether he can go in the second half. Tomorrow, the original field of 16 nations competing for the title of best on the planet will be down to two. Don't miss the 2003 FIFA Women's World Cup Final. Tomorrow, 1230 Eastern, 930 AM Pacific on ABC Sports. Championship television will be Germany taking on Sweden. Third and 13 with a minute 35 for Clawson and Tennessee. Pocket. Well protected, gets it off, a strike. And Jones with a gain of 17. They'll move the chains of the clock as at 128. Tennessee is mounting their first consistent drive of the evening. And they must be able to continue if they want to go into the half with the momentum. They've got to get points on the board here, at least a field goal, but preferably for them, a touchdown. This is the first time they've answered Georgia. Georgia has dominated in plays and in time of possession. Tennessee is finally beginning to answer by keeping drives alive in spite of penalties. And here Georgia's getting another one. Personal foul on Odell Thurman roughing the passer. That's three. That is three Georgia flags that have basically made this drive for Tennessee. Georgia has dominated the first half with the exception of some marvelous throwing and catching by Clawson and his wide receivers and the gift wrap penalties by the Bulldogs. From their own five, they've reached the Bulldog 
14. And Clawson again connects with Jones. Inside the 10. With two timeouts, plenty of time. And a great shot of heading into the halftime locker room with the lead. Down to one minute and a half. On this drive, they started at their five. Georgia has contributed 45 yards with three personal fouls. So right about half the work. Well, Tennessee gave them back 10 on the hold. Up the middle. Inside the five to the three goes Frederick Houston. First and goal. Beautiful job by Scott Wells, number 64, the center. Davis, or rather Cody Douglas, number 70, the right guard. Anthony Herrera, number 75, the left guard, knocking people off the ball. Timeout, 36 seconds. Georgia's lead in serious danger. You can see right away that things are different. We've added color and changed the portrait. Hi there. Tip the case, please. Sure. We've also improved the security features. Okay. The new 20. Oh. But the value remains the same. All bills are good for good. The new color of money. Safer, smarter, more secure. For the price of this bottle, how many glasses of pure filtered water can you get? This should give you some idea. Pure, just as good as bottled at a price that's 10 times less. Pure water filters. Your water should be pure. Well, what Georgia hasn't done for Tennessee with penalties on this drive, Clawson's done near perfect. Five out of six. Thomas Davis back in the game, the kind of guy that can make a difference right here in this situation. So first and goal. Volunteers at the three, out of the eye. And again, straight up the middle of Houston. They meet him and drive him back from the one. As the clock rolls, Tennessee with one more timeout. Throw it out of huddle. Will save that timeout and increase their options here. Boston on the sneak. And he did not get in. And with seven seconds, they finally call that last time out. Now, you're going to throw it? You're going to do a Bart Star of the Ice Bowl, sneak it? Or are you going to settle for three? We'll find out when Bill Fulmer makes up his mind after the timeout. Tennessee out of timeouts. Would you throw it here? Maybe that Georgia play they won in this stadium with two years ago. The play fake, pull back over the middle. Would Better, you nah, kick it? Would you nah. sneak it? Better an offensive line. Knock them in the back. Knock them in the back of the end zone and score. You want to be the champ? Play like champ. Fumble! Georgia recovers and look out on this return. This is going to be a Georgia 92-yard touchdown return for Sean Jones. Unbelievable. If you cannot execute offensive basics on the goal line, you do not deserve to be the champions of the Southeastern Conference. Coach Fulmer said something like that to his players. You've got a half inch to go for a touchdown. We're going to knock them back. We're going to score. The ball was mishandled. Kelly, Casey Clawson himself, hit it on his own thigh board and never got the handoff. Absolutely amazing. An unforced error on Casey Clawson. Period. And Bennett adds the extra point. 20 to 7 Georgia as it looked like Tennessee was poised to take the halftime lead a 14-point swing 
Let's look at it again. Clawson is going to have this bump off his fullback, Troy Fleming. Right there. You're right, Dave. I thought he hit it on his own thigh board, but Troy Fleming, the quarterback's job is to seat the ball in his stomach. There was no attempt at a fake. You're not trying to fake to the fullback. You let the fullback pass, do his lead block, and then you insert the ball into the pocket of the tailback. Didn't happen. The ball was left hanging out by the quarterback. It was the quarterback's error. Total disbelief. Horror. In Neyland Stadium, Sean Jones, 94-yard fumble return makes it 20-7, to Georgia, Matt Weiner. That is a stunner, Dave Barnett, a 14-point swing there at the end of the game, and now Tennessee is going to have to come back on the fifth-rated scoring defense in the country to try to avoid their first-ever four-game losing streak to the Bulldogs. It'll be... Seven thousand five hundred seventeen in Neyland Stadium. Still try to make sense of what happened on the final play of that first half. As good an explanation <laughs> as any, I suppose. There it is. You I figured mean, it out a long time ago. Dave. It looks, Maybe it is a full moon. It looks as if uh, Tennessee is ready to sneak it in, go up 14-13. Ninety-four yard fumble return by Sean Jones. Twenty to seven. Now, coaches have halftime speeches for. We're not playing as well as we should, or we're playing great. What's the halftime speech for? We just gave up a 94-yard fumble return. Well, I don't know what Coach Fulmer might say or Coach Rick, but what they could say is that's not going to define our season. We made a mistake on the goal line. That's inexcusable, but we turn it around now. If you're Mark Rick, you say we're not going to get any more freebies. We're going to have to earn it from here on in. Those kinds of things, that's just stuff that happens in football, but you can't make mistakes at the goal line. Tennessee will get it to start the second half. Riggs returns to the 32 and down below we go to Heather Cox. Dave, Tennessee coach Philip Fulmer definitely was devastated by that last play. He said certainly it changed the complexion of this game. Now we're in catch up. Look for them to go to the no huddle a lot like they did last week against Auburn. For Georgia, Mark Ripp very satisfied. He did say we have a young O-line so we're not running the ball as much as we like but I don't think we'll run it anymore. He did say the fumble recovery and the subsequent CD definitely a turning point. On a negative note, Fred Gibson is doubtful to return after re-aggravating that hamstring and injuring his knee. Well, Gibson hurt uh, very early tonight. So, how does Tennessee respond to disaster? Troy Fleming, whose collision with Casey Clawson caused that fumble at the end of the half. It is so unusual. In fact, we checked both record books, and neither Tennessee nor Georgia has a record for longest fumble return. So, we will assume with no evidence to the contrary that that's the longest in the history of both schools. We haven't seen any longer, have we? No. Continuing with the halftime themes for these teams, championship teams overcome adversity. When you shoot yourself in the foot as often as Tennessee has in this first half, then you come out the second half and you got a chance to show what you're made of. If you're Georgia, you got a big break. You got a chance to capitalize on it by continuing to keep the hammer down. What Georgia's got to do is eliminate the dumb penalties they had seven penalties for 69 yards in the first half. That's that's an incredible number of penalties for a disciplined squad like Georgia usually is. They contributed about half the yardage on that near 95-yard touchdown drive, would-be touchdown drive, that uh, ended so shockingly and disastrously for Clawson. Running and up for the first down, 41 yard line. Offset on. Off and throwing behind his intended receiver, Mark Jones. And our Xerox game track through the first half. Jones is a big part of it. Taking that one away from DeCorey Bryant to complete the longest pass play in Tennessee history 90 yards for their touchdown. 
previous turnover on the fumble by Houston then this on the final play of the half picked up by Sean Jones all you saw was about four or five white jerseys accompanying him final 90 yards of that sprint 14 point switch ending the half Lawson steps up and again to the fullback Fleming senior from Franklin Tennessee to the 46. Let's talk about Casey Clawson and the talk that he had prior to this game, after last year's game, that so aroused the Bulldogs. You can get away with all that with your squad as long as you produce. When you go to the goal line and bounce it off the fullback and it's run back on you, then that stuff starts to stack up and your teammate starts looking at you funny. Clawson missed the last meeting with a broken left collarbone. But so impressed his teammates and coaches as he played other than that the whole second half of the year. Overthrown here. Intended for James Banks. Clawson not only with the broken collarbone but a high ankle sprain. So did what he did last year basically on one arm and one leg. And this drive will end with a punt from around midfield. Well, it looks like he might ought to be at Venice Beach working on his surfboard techniques and hanging tin or whatever it is they do. And he has his spiked hairdo, and he has his California image, but he is tough as nails. His teammates know it. But if he's going to talk, he's going to have to walk the walk. He's got to be productive as the QB and the leader. He's got to get him in the end zone and win for them. He's done it in the past, and the heat's really on him here now. Well, here's an odd Georgia timeout. Waiting for a punt. Really odd. Just a minute, nine seconds into the third quarter. Well, there are some outstanding quarterbacks in the SEC. Eli Manning of Ole Miss at the top of the list. And then you have Mississippi State's Kevin Fan. David Green of Georgia. And uh, Tennessee's own Lawson, number four. The SEC passing list. Fifth highest rated passer in the history of the SEC, in fact, Lawson. So there's a lot of substance to his game. Well, he can play. But if he's going to do the talk, if he's going to do his little foibles, then he's got to be productive in the clutch. And he's got to do it over and over. You know, if you're not aware of the statement that caused uh, all the bulletin board activity in Athens, he said that last year, I could have played on one arm and he could have definitely beaten Georgia. They used that to great advantage all week. Georgia did in getting ready. No flag on the putt by Colt when he went down. He got off a 47-yarder. And the Tennessee fans fully expected to see a flag, but they didn't. Brian McClendon and the omnipresent David Pollock right there. That leg's extended. You are highly vulnerable. Nobody touched him. It was pretty wonderful acting. This guy leads the nation in net punting. That's not an accident. The drop of the football is the most important thing. His is perfect. Just look how the ball is aligned. Not a very good drawing there, but it is flat with his foot. David Green starts the second half the way he started the first by hitting his tight end, Ben Watson. 19 more yards, and Watson having a big night tonight. Having dropped the ball properly, the leg must extend. The ball must strike the top of the foot precisely, and that leg must come straight up and swing on a perfect axis. Look at the flexibility all the way above the head, right in the middle of the face mask. Perfect form, Justin Coffey. Browning. David Green tonight, 17 of 20. 170 yards and a touchdown. Five of those are to Watson, 51 yards. Watson is an interesting guy. He's transferred from Duke University, a marvelous student. He wanted to play at a place where the football team had a chance to be a dominant team, and here he is. Green has hit 15 of his last 16. And another well-carried-out fake. Here's an incompletion, though, as he throws it over 
Jeremy Thomas. Heather with uh, Dustin Colquitt. It's all in the family, isn't it? It is. Talk about a legacy. He is the son of Craig Colquitt, the cousin of Jimmy Colquitt, both of them former vol hunters who went on to play on Sundays as dad Craig went on to hunt for the Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh Steelers while Jimmy kicked for the Seattle Seahawks. Dustin is also joined on the squad this season by his brother, Britton. And I'm thinking, if you don't have the last name Colquitt, I'm not sure you should apply for position as punter for Tennessee, guys. Yeah, it's generally taken. And there are quite a few legacies on this Tennessee roster. Of course, we heard from Anthony Munoz. We chat with Heather, uh, his chat with Heather in the first half. Oh, you mentioned Joe Raymond piece. Yep. Earl Riggs Jr., of course. Kind of Long-time NFL running back. Knocked out of the 46, Michael Johnson, who has a touchdown catch tonight. That uh, should be, if he's given any kind of a spot, good enough for a first down. He didn't get much of a spot, and it's very close. Not sure if he got it. And Jason Allen was right there. Johnson might have helped his cause had he lowered his shoulder and tried to turn it upfield rather than just continuing out of bounds because I think this is going to be um, maybe just a couple of inches short based on the spot he got. Well, right. As you said, would you say a couple inches? That's what I said. Uh, that's a couple inches. Where is big Mike Golick when we need him? He would him? be proud of you. He would be stunned. He would he would be speechless. He was no, he wouldn't know that that wouldn't happen. Would that's it? never happened. But he prides himself in his spots before the chain comes out. So fourth and they say he did not get to that yellow line. And the official's right there. He saw where the foot went down and where the ball was. So he made the decision. Looks like George is going to go for it or try to draw him offside. That may be more likely from their own 45. No, they go for it. And Green with the sneak will have it. They'll give him a couple inches and a couple of feet besides that. Boy, but how gutsy is that? Well, that's gutsy, especially when you got a young offensive line. And I think Mark Rick is really trying to get the confidence. Neil Calloway, the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach, is really trying to make statements in the game by entrusting things to the O-line, saying, look, we believe in you. Now you got to knock some people back. Russ Tanner, Josh Brock, Bartley Miller, we need you. you, you interior three, got to play a little bit better. That's what Coach Calloway told us in our Wednesday conference call. All right, now, I call this one. Now, now Mike Golick would be proud of me. Yep. How about that? Let's check in with Matt Weiner. All right, Dave, Ohio State and Wisconsin. 19-game winning streak on the line. The Badgers draw first blood. Booker Stanley bounces outside, two yards in. 7-0 Badgers. Rainy throughout the Midwest, as it is in Columbia, Missouri. Brad Smith has already caught a touchdown pass, and now he's run one in. Quarterback keeper, 39 yards. Mizzou back within three. Generations have come and gone since Missouri last beat Nebraska. Green over the middle, deep and incomplete. Again, trying to hook up with Watson. Tennessee's fine free safety, the senior Rashad Baker, bruised his uh, thigh, deep thigh bruise, in the second quarter. And they list him questionable to see any action this half. Holding on the option, 10-yard penalty. Now remains one. Baker not in there right now. Daniel Inman, the split tackle, number 72, meaning he lines up away from the tight end, the left tackle in this case. He grabs the back of it. Well, he grabs everything he can on Constantine Richmond and just rides him into the ground and is apprehended and penalized. So first and 20. Green from his 36 again out of the gun. And they give to Tyson Browning. Browning recruited 
as a defensive back by just about everybody except two schools. And it came down to Kentucky and Georgia who wanted him as a running back, and Mark Rigg got him from Watkinsville, Georgia. Now watch Russ Tanner here. Very often he'll point a certain direction. There he goes. He's pointing over to his right with his left hand. He's telling everybody who to block. Running motion out of the backfield. Reggie Brown is at a quiet night. Shows his burst, and he's knocked out. Tennessee territory inside the 48. A gain of 14. and set up third and short. Now let's see what the protection accomplished, and where did the protection go? He pointed with his left hand to the right. We'll see that. All right, and that's communicated out to the other lineman. He snaps the ball at his discretion. They're sliding to the left. He pointed to the right, slid to the left. The protection's perfect. You see Bartley Miller there doing a good job. Number 73. The Green got a nice completion. They got a short attempt for the first down. They need three. That was only the second catch it out by Brown, the leading receiver. Over the middle, another first down. Brown with this catch as well. And 11 yards. Excuse me, Dave. What George is getting here is exactly what they want. They're getting blitzing as they approach Tennessee territory. Not unusual. We knew that Coach Chavis had this in the plan, which means one-on-one -on -one coverage. They're picking up the blitzes. Their backs are doing a nice job of stepping up. Coach Chavis, who seldom smiles anyhow, is not happy with the most recent developments. Seldom? Never. But never. Well, never. Not much to smile about right now. George is continuing their march. Browning is cut from behind the line. Andre Dickerson all over him. Let's check in with Matt. Well, Dave, Gary Pinkle is pretty much emptying the playbook to try to beat Nebraska. Field goal set up to tie the game, mind you. Santino Riccio, the backup quarterback on the fake, finds Victor Cisse in the end zone. Tigers up by four. All right, so tonight, a final through the night in Columbia. Meanwhile, here in Knoxville, 107,517. Holding on the offense. The penalty is declined. Second down. And he'll keep that loss of yardage on the tackle behind the line by Mondre Dickerson. The coaches wanted Mondre Dickerson to become the leader of the young defensive line. He's doing it tonight. He's been outstanding all night. Senior coming off a career game, seven tackles last week at Auburn. Michael Cooper. To the 34. Red shirt freshman. Trading off the tailback with the sophomore Browning tonight. College game day final tonight, midnight Eastern, 9 Pacific. It's your final wrap of all the day's action, the highlights from separation Saturday. Reese Davis, Rev Alberts, Mark May in the studio for College Game Day Final. They've got their work cut out. Summarizing it in the country today. Miami, Florida State, OU, Texas. Penn State, Purdue. At Nebraska, Missouri. Florida, LSU. On and on and on. Third and seven, Green. Flushed. Throwing off Collins. A strike down to the 16-yard line. And 18 yards to number 18. Damian Gary. Green does it again. Off balance. It's got to be his best pass of the night. Georgia just keeps right on coming, right on expecting the blitz. Here they come. One, two. Stop it right there for kid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. With the defensive end dropping off. So it's a variation of the zone blitz. Nobody open. Green showing a little mobility to his left and a perfect throw. Play action to the end zone and overthrown intended for Gary. Last week, Tennessee couldn't stop the run by Auburn. Gave up 264 yards on the ground. The run defense is there for Tennessee tonight. Georgia has just 50 rushing yards. They can't stop Green through the air. He's 21 of 26, 218 yards. And a couple of those were deliberate throwaways. So when he is zeroed in on a target, he's hit it almost every time tonight. He reads blitz here. He's changing the play. And over the middle for 
Reggie Brown right at the six. Ten yard pickup and very likely they may have a first and goal here. But these things don't just happen. Green was being hit regularly early in the game. Now Cooper's in the game number five. A freshman tailback. And he steps up and picks up the middle blitzer. Okay, let's let's run it through here. Here he comes from this right here. Perfect pickup on Simon. Knocks him by the quarterback. Green has a wide open perspective and makes another completion. That's hours and hours of practicing this pickup. It is first and goal. Cooper looks to the corner, gets a turn, standing up. Touchdown, untouched. And Georgia opens up a 26 to 7 lead. And the transfer, Ben Watson, the big powerful tight end. The walk on Jeremy Thomas, the fullback number 41, 89 and 41 respectively, just escorted their man Cooper right into the end zone. No contained by the Tennessee defense. Billy Bennett just does hook that extra point in. And you talk about a killer drive. As damaging as the fumble return at the end of the half was, this may be every bit as damaging to the Tennessee psyche. Cooper puts Georgia up 20. Casey Clawson thought he was putting Tennessee ahead 14-13 at the half. Fumble return, now an extended drive, 14 plays, 83 yards, Georgia. They open it up. The Tennessee mindset now. I mean, first of all, you think they've got to go no huddle, three touchdowns down. What else do they have to be thinking? they got to be thinking about playing defense and keeping contained. When Georgia wants to run the ball, they run outside. They've been successful. So... 51 plays to 31, that's possessing the football, and it just grinds the defense into fine powder. And Gerald Riggs finally figuring out you run away from those kicks that close to the pylon. Boston just saw David Green hit six out of eight for 77 yards on that touchdown drive, and Green for the night now, 20 two of 27 228 yards and he overcame two more 15 yard penalties or rather 10 yard penalties and so they got six eight penalties for 80 yards now two more on that drive so they really drove it about 97 yards against the, a tennessee defense that's going to get tired now tennessee needs to go no huddle but they also need to keep the ball for a while and not put that defense right back out Start with a play fake. Wobbler over the middle, intercepted. Georgia, first and goal, five-yard line. Odell Thurman returns it 26 yards. Now, David, if I let you guess who got the pressure on the quarterback, do you think you could figure out David who Paul. might have caught? Now, he doesn't have a bunch of stats this year. This doesn't go in the stat book as a sack. But this is David Pollock manhandling the right tackle. John Young, number 66, just gets turned like a revolving door. Pollock is in the quarterback's face. The ball has popped up, and Georgia has it right back on the five-yard line. Well, after seeing what Michigan did in Minnesota last night, you can't say any game is over in the third quarter or any lead is insurmountable. Mondre Dickerson breaks through again. However, Georgia gets a touchdown here. They're uh, putting Tennessee in the position of asking for a miracle. But then again, that's what we saw Michigan pull off last night. Well, I'll tell you, it almost happened last week for Tennessee down at Auburn. They were just being blown out, and they came back and got right back in that game. This is home. This is Browning, and he'll spin down to the eighth. This Tennessee crowd, again, just less than seven minutes ago on the clock thought they'd have a halftime lead you hardly ever see that I, i've got to assume those folks are just going for concessions no they had they got babysitter they've got to they come gotta, back no the babysitter has to be home those who are here 
are stunned. They are quiet. So this is usually when they're deafening. You're down at this end and trying to get it in the end zone. You just can't summon the will to try and drown out David Green. Third and goal. And Browning cuts back, finds an opening, touchdown. night long when Georgia's attempted to run the ball up the pipe they've had almost no success but Daniel Inman who was called for holding on that previous drive and again Ben Watson get the now injured Tyler Tyson Browning into the backfield and um, just have to hope that this is a minor thing when they've wanted to get outside they've done just beautifully great job of blocking by Daniel Inman 72 just drives his man into the ground Nice job by Watson. That guy that you see wearing the defensive end gathers, or rather, Constantine Richmond is Daniel Inman. Browning in midair looked like he took a knee in the back from Jabril Wilson, number eight, the strong safety. Wilson looks fine, but Browning still uh, just now up to a sitting position. Absolutely stunning. Browning getting a hand from several thousand Georgia fans. This is their end zone. Most of the Georgia fans are down there right where he scored. And a pat on the back from Jabril Wilson. Sportsmanship is alive and well in college football, and we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it enough. Wilson comes over and pats him on the back. Even with all the embarrassment that's going on with the score, Wilson comes over. He's respectful of his opponent. Joe Bennett right back out for another extra point. And it is 34-7 Georgia in Knoxville. The Bulldogs have built a 27-point lead. That's not the only thing they know how to build. Yes, you ESPN2's College Football Saturday. Brought to you by Suzuki's award-winning automobiles, motorcycles, ATVs, and marine engines. All proud sponsors of the Heisman Trophy. And by Mentos, the fresh maker. Cast your votes for the Mentos Game Maker Moment of the Week at ESPN.com. Keyword Mentos. George has broken this one open. Even the fans that have orange hair can imagine that this would be 34-7 midway third quarter. Good, finally with one, he can return. And gets it out to the 26. Send it down to Heather Cox. Dave, this summer the Georgia football players traded in their helmets and their shoulder pads for some hammers and some nails. The players, coaches, and managers all spent the summer building a house for Habitat for Humanity. They did all the work, well, minus the plumbing and the electrical, on a three-bedroom, one-bath house. Safety control Curry had some previous experience. He trained home during summers in high school, but Mark Drick said it was literally an incredible team-building experience, guys. That is uh, one of the best off-the-field projects I think we've heard of. And most teams do try to come up with some community-oriented effort that they can uh, use their fame to good advantage. And uh, Mark Ritz found himself a really good way to put his team in his young, yes, strong do. collection of bodies. Steve. Yes, they do. And Mark Ritz is very active in the community. Very active with very, uh, all kinds of groups and giving of himself and his time. He looks at that 9-1 road record and refuses to take that much credit for it. He gives much more credit to David Green. Another tip ball and another Georgia interception. The second straight tip picked off. Robert Gathers. And now they got to be separated. Three flags are down there. Golston being held away from a group of Tennessee players. And every official now 
is involved in trying to keep these teams separated. They've, they've each got a little group that they're trying to herd back toward their own bench. Good job by the coaches, Philip Fulmer, Mark Rick, both on the field, getting those big guys back where they belong. This is where it can get ugly. It's getting embarrassing. People are losing their temper. And a really good job by Penn Wager as the referee and his crew. And uh, the officials are right on top of it. We haven't seen yet who started it or who continued it. Golston with the tip. High into the air. Another tip pickoff for Georgia. As that one comes right down to Gathers. And as Golston celebrates with Gerald Anderson, he then turns back oh, yeah. toward... A, what that, could have easily become a melee. <laughs> yeah, what a great job by John, his assistants. That's John Fabris. John Fabris was on our staff at Georgia Tech early, and John, doesn't, you ain't got enough lead in your britches to stop that big guy. Golson's going to drag John all the way into the fight. John weighs about 160 pounds now, soaking wet. Golson is dragging him like a wet puppy. Well, there goes... The apparently ejected Derek White, Georgia linebacker. Let's we'll see if anybody else is tossed here. That's a great job by John Fabris, who sacrificed his body. Dawson could have turned around and flicked him off like a flea. Then he got a little assistance from somebody else who was also being dragged. Because he was going to get in that fight. And the rules say that you've got to keep your players on the bench when altercations begin. Well, quite a bit to sort out here. But we thought David Green might have some problems with tip balls. Casey Clawson, who also has a nice high release. I don't believe this. There's no explanation, no further talk of all those flags. We just see Derek White leave, and now Green back to work. Going to add to this 34 7 lead. Bouncing off the pack, inside the five, diving. Touchdown, Craig Lumpkin. 22 yards for the true freshman, and Georgia blows it wide, wide open now, 40 to 7. Not that it matters very much in the instance of this particular football game, but the officials should have explained all of that to both benches and to the crowd and to us. 53 white. Show him doing anything to get thrown out, well, but he, he was, was. He was breaking up the fight. He was pulling somebody off the pile, and as so often happens, you get thrown out when you're trying to break up the fight. So everybody forgets about playing football except Lumpkin, who runs it in the end zone. On a night where Georgia can do absolutely no wrong, it's 41 to 7. It's week six. Are you? Who would have figured? 41-7, Georgia. Four Tennessee turnovers. Tempers flared. We just saw the ejection a moment ago of Derek White. And now we see what it was that got him tossed. He continued it with Tennessee's uh, fullback, Troy Fleming, and that's what led to his ejection. He threw the punch right in front of the officials, and the fans are going to get on Clawson big time, and he's at risk of losing his relationship with his squad because of the call. Riggs. Might be a nice return. It's back to the 32. Let's go to the studio and hear from Matt Weiner. Dave, there is some kind of party brewing in Columbia, Missouri right now. Brad Smith, ball fake, bootleg, second touchdown run of the game. That made it 34-24. They missed the extra point. Nebraska needs to get something going. Jamal Lord looking to make something happen. Picked by Zach Bill. 39-yard return led to another Brad Smith touchdown. It is 41-24, under five minutes to go. 
Wow, and it looked like they'd fixed the black shirts. They were the number one defense in the country coming in this week. Who had they played? Well, good point. Hadn't played Brad Smith. Riggs on the carry. Now, Tennessee down 34, but it sounds like you're seeing a larger issue, and that has to do with Clawson and his relationship to his teammates, who are now, you think, thinking back to what he said a year ago, well, where he said, if I had played, we could have beaten uh, Georgia on one arm. Thinking about everything, including that. And this goes to the coaching staff at the team. The Tennessee, this doesn't happen to Tennessee, ever. And certainly not in their own stadium. Riggs out of bounds. Three, third, and four. Coming in, both these teams had one loss in the division. So basically an elimination game. One loss maximum wins the East. All but the very first year of divisional play in the SEC. So with that picture in the East, you turn it over to the West. And with uh, Auburn improving to 3 0, Ole Miss undefeated. LSU loses for the first time today. As does Arkansas. Arkansas beaten at home by Auburn. And Auburn defense held Arkansas without a touchdown today. Intended for Mark Jones. So while this probably ends the East race or the, the West race is going to be something that probably Bill goes right down to the final weekend of the season and you can look at the LSU Arkansas match that may finally uh, figure out who plays apparently Georgia in the SEC championship game. Yeah and uh, you know and who's undefeated over there now in league play? Auburn Tigers remember how they were reviled not so long ago. Yep. But when they got the league play, they started playing some football, and now they're tough. This guy is some kind of punter. Boy, didn't get a hop on that one. Had quite a 62-yard punt off with a 4.7 hang time. That's what kind of leg Dustin Folk would have. That's how you lead the nation in net punting, and of course, it's not going to help them tonight, but in most games, that is one of the most important statistics right there behind ball security. Georgia's just taken this game over in every conceivable way. Sunday night football tomorrow on ESPN. First place, Seattle against Terrell Owens and the San Francisco 49ers. Sunday night football, 830 Eastern on ESPN. Nationwide available on ESPN HD, high definition. NFL primetime presented by Miller Lite. Begins everything at 7.30 Eastern. New quarterback, B.J. Shockley is in for the first time. And Shockley takes off all the way to the 46-yard line. A 26-yard scramble. Sophomore, College Park, Georgia, Parade All-America. Great, great players come from College Park, Georgia, Dave. Like, uh... Well, Bill Curry like, comes to mind. <laughs> really, actually like DJ. <laughs> like Shockley. This is your worst nightmare as a coaching staff. You're being pummeled. The fresh quarterback comes in with quick legs, a quick arm. He wants to run the offense. He wants to earn his spot. And you got to play against him. Shockley, last year, part of a two-quarterback system with Green until he broke his foot. Week two in this four games. And uh, very little action since that injury with Green solidifying his hold on the quarterback position. He played for his father, Don, in high school. Well, he's just a marvelous player. He's week two in this four games. And uh, very little action since that injury with Green solidifying his hold on the quarterback position. He played for his father, Don, in high school. Well, he's just a marvelous player. He's smart. He understands offense. He just got behind a guy that is a hot quarterback and has been for three years. Speaking of hot, Green may be done for tonight in 22 of 27. Shockley has played some in every game this year. He's only thrown 20 passes. Craig Lumpkin for the most recent Georgia touchdown. True freshman. And now, as everyone can see, 
the long lamented lost art of running the football inside for the University of Georgia is developing now at this moment. Those young offensive linemen, those middle three that Neil Calloway talked to us about, Josh Brock, Russ Tanner, Bartley Miller, coming off that football, knocking some people back, making four and five yards a pop. Important for Georgia as they continue their march in the SEC East. The run game, offensively and defensively, the story last week. Here's the timeout. Still no running attack to speak of for Tennessee. 23 yards on the ground. Georgia now at 118. 346 total yards for the Bulldogs. And let's ask our athletic trivia question now. I bet uh, Phil Fulmer would know the answer to this. Who was the last Tennessee player inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame? Don't just blurt it out. I don't Think know. Think about it. I, no, okay. I actually don't know for once. Well, I'm not going to torture you. The answer is Reggie White. Reggie White. Have I told you my Reggie White story? I'm you have, but I love it. Tell, I'm it tell it to you again. I'm standing right down there in that tunnel coming out from the visitor's locker room. I wish I could point it out. This fellow here could point it out to you. He's not very happy. There it is. I'm standing right inside somewhere back in there with my Georgia Tech team, 1983, and I hear a gravelly voice giving the invocation out here as the band is playing and the sort of thing that sort of makes everybody teary-eyed. And I turned to the security guard and I said, who's that praying? He said, ask Reggie. He prays too. It was the Minister of Defense, Reggie White, and I knew we were in trouble, and we, and, and we were in trouble. You had to play yeah. him, and then you had no doubt who was on his side, either. That, too. And, and everybody in the NFL learned it over the next 19 years. Third and one. And it was nice to see wishes Reggie was still in uniform and eligible. Shockley, option keeper for the first down. And down to the 40. You know, you, you tell that story, and it puts me in mind of 1985 or so in an ESPN telecast of a young head coach, Bill Curry, and his Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Oh, my gosh. Where'd you find this thing? <laughs> They were so lucky to tie us that night. 6-6, huh? Yep, Darrell Dickey was their quarterback, did a great job for him. It was his first start, and they went on to win the SEC and the Sugar Bowl over Miami. They were lucky to tie us. Michael Cooper. Well, that was a leader of men we just saw. Thank you. You coached here. You also played here. Don't you hold a record? You, I you do. hold a Neyland yeah, Stadium record. I hold a Neyland Stadium record. And, uh, Can you demonstrate? <laughs> no, <laughs> I would need a football. I would need a football, and I'd need uh, to be able to get in a center stance, which I really can't do anymore. I um, I hold the record for the longest long snap in the stadium. My junior year, Billy Lothridge was our quarterback, runner-up for the Heisman Trophy. I snapped the ball 35 yards over his head into the wow. end zone. 35 yards. Mm -hmm. Hold the rest. You only wife, tried for 15. Right? My wife, yeah, 15 was what I was supposed to snap. I had just gotten my hand out of a cast. And uh, I was thinking, gee, my hand is weak. I need to really fire this ball. And it looked like Lothridge was way back there. So I fired it. And sure enough, it sailed and sailed. That awful sound, the roar of the crowd after you take about two steps covering the punt. And you know there's only one thing that could have happened. I turn and Lothridge is chasing the ball. He picks it up, runs it back out. The ball, Tennessee takes over at our 15-yard line. We sack him twice, knock it loose. We got first down with one yard gained from the exchange. That's how lucky I was. Well, was part of you in awe of how far you snapped it? <laughs> no. <laughs> None of me was in awe. No bright side at all. Going deep, Reggie Brown in the end zone, and intercepted. Tennessee forces the first Georgia turnover. 
Now, there will be people here that will say, well, what are they doing trying to run up the score? Beautiful interception by Corey Campbell, two freshmen, free safety for Tennessee. But Mark Rick is not trying to run up the score. He's trying to get some reps for D.J. Shockley because next week he may have to play if David Green goes down. He's got to learn, learn to run the offense. A terrific interception by Campbell. His first as a collegian. Green, Texas. Blue freshman double covers back there on Brown with Anquan Stewart. And the first Georgia turnover of the night with 122 to go third quarter. Now, what can Casey Clawson salvage from tonight in the rest of the Tennessee offense? Riggs on the carry. Down to Heather. Well, guys, Georgia's Tyson Browning, who's really emerged as a leader at the running back position with Tony Milton out, has a lower back contusion. He will be held out for the remainder of this game. More a byproduct of the score and the fact that Coach Rick is very comfortable with the running back by committee strategy that he's had to use all season long. A lot of players getting reps behind the quarterback tonight. You know, that would tend to make you comfortable with a 34-point lead, especially. So... Any more where he came from. On the cross, Riggs, and he's run down from behind for no game. Let's check in with Matt Weiner. All right, Dave, let's head out west. Pac-10, USC taking on Stanford tonight in Southern California. Matt Weiner, play action. Mike Williams on the other end. This could set up a chosen field goal, and that's where we stand. It's 6-0. Well, that's the USC that uh, shut out Auburn, the opener, at Auburn. Started the Tigers off on such a bad note. This is Robert Gethers, defensive end. So many big plays in this one for Georgia. It got out of hand late in the first half. When it appeared, Tennessee would lead at the half 14-13. Instead, the fumble to change. And the 94-yard return by Sean Jones, which made it 20 to 7 Georgia at the half, a 14-point swing, and Tennessee has not come close to recovering from that. As Gutters jogs off, no, and then Georgia came out and drove the ball on their first possession, took it the length of the field into the end zone, and that's what really softened it. Georgia may. And Tennessee, for that matter, may look back at that play as not only the key of tonight, but in this season's gone, the key play of the year. Here's a flag as Pollock finally gets himself a sack. He's so close so often and had been credited with only a half sack to the season coming in, but 17 quarterback pressures, near sacks. Well, they beat Cody Douglas there. He just loves to play football. Oh, on the offense. They'll turn it down. He got the sack. He's so happy he gets a complete sack all by his lonesome. He loves to play at night, but I got a feeling he likes to play in the middle of the afternoon. He'd be happy to play at 8 o'clock in the morning. He just loves to play tackle. And Douglas has got his hands full. He can't even grab him. He's trying to grab him and drag him down. He can't even get a hold of him. He's so fast. He is one heck of a football player. And he's a joy to be around, according to his teammates. No joy in Knoxville tonight for 107,517. Well, minus a few thousand Georgia fans. They couldn't be more joyful. David Pollock and the Bulldogs have a rare feat in progress. They're blowing out the balls in their own backyard. Well, even when you're behind 41 to 7, you can find a reason to smile if you get your face on national TV. That, that's about the only thing that has Tennessee fans forgetting their misery here. Colquitt with a shank. He's had a couple of those tonight. He had an 18-yarder in the first half. This one's not a whole lot better. 32. The nation's number one net punter. And the first play of the fourth quarter, kind of in keeping with tonight's theme. Let's uh, send it down below to Heather Cox. Dave, I was certainly hoping to have better news to report for you, but Vol center Chuck Frew remains in a critical condition for the second week in ICU with a mysterious illness that doctors believe to be a 
combination of pneumonia, mono, and the flu. He's also suffering from complications of infection in his lungs and his spleen. His best friend and roommate, Jason Respert, was able to visit Chuck earlier this week. And although Chuck can't talk because of the ventilator he's on, he was able to smile, wink, and give the thumbs up sign. And to Chuck and his family, we all certainly wish him a very speedy recovery. Yeah, we do. And uh, what a disturbing story that is. A guy who's, who's just fine one day, and then the next day running 106 degree temperature. It hit him September 26th. It's in the surgical critical care unit. And uh, Coach Fulmer and the rest of the Tennessee football family just hoping that uh, he can pull his way out of that uh, very serious situation. Well, everybody we've talked to has had tears in their eyes talking about Chuck, and everybody here has him in their prayers, as we will. It's, it's just a nightmare scenario. Mainly because they've had such a hard time figuring out what the problem is. Let's check in with Matt Wine. Guys, the Missouri Athletic Department will gladly write checks for a couple of new goalposts in Columbia. They came down tonight after Missouri's first win over Nebraska since 78, first home win over Nebraska since 73, first win over a top 10 team at home since 74, 41 24. Those goalposts are headed to Harpo's, by the way. I bet that goalpost has been standing for decades. <laughs> when was the last time Missouri fans had reason to tear down Those a goalpost? Those goalposts have not been at risk. But the smartest thing we saw was at Iowa when they just had the mechanized goalposts and they just folded them down before the crowd could get to it. Yeah, it's like the snapback ram in basketball. I'm surprised that everybody doesn't have it. Lumpkin, to 43. Now, if you're Georgia and you're looking ahead at the fact that you've had a ter terrific time with Florida, Georgia's lost their last five in a row to the Gators and 12 out of the last 13. They keep working on their running game inside. Nice job of those same three young linemen that I cited a while ago. Josh Cross, Russ Tanner, Bartley Miller. And they're going to keep working at the weaknesses that have hurt them coming into this game. That weakness has not been corrected. The Tennessee running attack and the Tennessee run defense. Exposed by Auburn. And much of the same from Georgia tonight on both sides of the ball. James Banks decides to try and return that punt by Ely Kelso. A 30 yarder, but well placed down to the 14. Smoky, and at one time, 107,517 here at Neyland Stadium. Rapidly emptying. Well, let's see, what was that uh, Michigan fourth quarter last night against Minnesota? Was it 31-7? It was a 31-point quarter. 31 quarter. That's what Tennessee's facing because of this Xerox game track and one debacle after another. And they're down 41-7. Houston on the carry for 13 yards. And on the, the flip side of the discussion about Georgia moving ahead through the year, Tennessee needs to do exactly what they're doing right now, run their offense and see if they can't do a better job of making some blocks up front, squeezing the football, untracking some of these outstanding young backs they've got, and play hard through the end of the game. You get hurt if you don't play hard. And you notice Crossing's still in. So is Cedric Houston, the starter at tailback. Cedric Houston, Gary. Well, Phil Fulmer after tonight settles through his system we have a trip to alabama in two weeks duke mississippi state vanderbilt here they go to kentucky those teams eight and 19. and then november 8th they have the honor the pleasure the challenge of taking on that miami team that the fun whooped up in tallahassee today on yep. florida state as much more convincing win than the final score of 22-14. Third straight carry, and Houston should have the first down at the 38. You're wondering about history. Georgia doesn't beat Tennessee by 34 very often. In fact, only a couple of games in the series that are even close to this level of blowout. The worst loss ever to Georgia, 1981 in Athens, 44-0. 
Of course, home loss here in Knoxville was 33 nothing. So, a series that generally is very close. The last two games decided by a total of seven points. Rivers won the last three. They've never won four straight, but that's what they're on the way to doing with ten and a half minutes to go. This series, all Cedric Houston. Now, Tennessee, looking ahead at those games you just mentioned, will look far more vulnerable to those teams who are not accustomed to beating or even competing very well with Tennessee. They will view these guys entirely differently. They will play with a sharper edge, and it'll be harder for Tennessee to beat those teams than it has been in the past. Boston, after the play fake, too tall. Intended for Tony Brown. Well, the good news is Tennessee is one of the best November teams in college football. They're 37 and 3 in the month of November. <laughs> They've been pretty good in September and October, too. <laughs> That's with Fulmer as the head coach. And uh, since 1985, 68 and 4 in November. That's the last 18 months of November. So maybe that history will help him out against the likes of Miami. C.J. Leak, the backup to Boston, we haven't seen him yet. We would figure at some point he'd get some action. Drop right in the hands of Brown. Looked away, couldn't hang on. On a third and nine. Just one failure after another. On all three phases of the ball. Leak has not been a part of it yet, but the offense has managed just 47 rushing yards, 212 total yards. Defense has given up 362. They've turned it over four times. Colquitt has not had his usual numbers even, and uh, it all adds up to a rare home blowout for Tennessee. Fairly short and fair caught by Gary at the 25, just 35 yards. 9.40 to go. 41 7 Georgia. Under the lights at Neyland Stadium, which we'll discuss. We got back to Knoxville. Have you been waiting for these new homestyle chicken strips? Another reason it's better here. Georgia ball for 25, 9 minutes and 40 seconds to go. Shockley still the quarterback. And Michael Cooper gets another carry. There are a lot of coaches, a lot of players who much prefer day games. They would rather play the earlier the better. Mark Richt in Georgia tends to be on the other side. Mark Richt doesn't mind night games. In fact, he says he kind of likes being able to watch other games during the afternoon, kind of get a feel for what else is going on around the country. And then playing under the lights, do you think that makes him unusual as head coaches go? There are, uh, head coaches have all different kind of takes on that. Pollock, for instance, loves playing at night. Uh, David Green detests playing at night. He says, I get too wired and get too worked up while I'm waiting and thinking too much and out thinking myself sometimes. So it's, it's a very much an individual matter. When you were coaching, was a big concern of yours when you had a night kickoff, how your players were spending their Saturday before it was time to go to the stadium? It depended on the team. If we had a mature team, that was one thing. If we had an immature team, we had them every few hours, we would have a meeting. We'd go out in the parking lot, we'd do a walkthrough. If it was a full moon, we'd do two or three walkthroughs. <laughs> we're so interested in the full moon. And seriously, if we had a real mature squad, then they could handle getting themselves ready and watch the other games, and they like doing that. Sometimes we'd leave it to the leadership of the squad. That 85 squad we saw that played so well that whole year, including that year, uh, people like Pat Swilling and Ted Ruth, those guys could, could take care of business. So we knew we had the leadership on the squad that we could trust them to spend their time properly. We had some other squads we had to watch. Cooper carried again, and 
Ely Kelso will punt on fourth and six. And Philip Fulmer is one of the winningest coaches in America since he took over this job. Last year they were eight and five, got hammered in the Peach Bowl. They come back this year and this happens. This is not what happens to Tennessee football. He's got something really important on his hands and I'm not sure what he should do. Thanks. Return of uh, eight yards, and let's check in with Matt Weiner. Dave, four teams in the top ten lost already today. Virginia Tech was not one of them. They did what they're supposed to do, beating an unranked team, and D'Angelo Hall did more than his part. Three touchdowns on the day, including two punt returns for touchdowns. He also had a touchdown run, and Tech rolled over Syracuse 51-7. to Wisconsin. Now into the third quarter, about to start the third quarter in Madison, leading Ohio State. The Buckeyes' win streak stands at 19, but being tested tonight. And a hand as C.J. Leak finally checks in it again. See the backup quarterback. Backup quarterback's always popular, sometimes the most popular player in town. He gives to Gerald Riggs. Leak from Charlotte. 10 games in two seasons after transferring from Wake Forest. He started the meeting last year with Georgia with Boston nursing the broken left collarbone. So uh, Leak may be the rest of the way. I'm kind of hoping that he doesn't go the rest of the way. Nothing against him. I just hope that his backup gets in just so we can talk about it. Jim Bob Cooter, greatest football player in the country. Jim Bob Cooter, that's one of the best names I've heard in a long time. Jim Bob needs some time. He's just a freshman. Leak keeping. And uh, rolls over to Mario Minter at midfield. And, and it'll and be third and two. We ought to tell folks who his little brother is. Well, that would be George Chris Leak. George is going to see young Chris Leak. In a few weeks in Jacksonville, who had a marvelous game today. I, I, I assume he did. I hadn't seen the statistics, but he and his Gators went down to Baton Rouge and beat the Bayou Bengals 19 to 7. About them out. Sometimes you think Florida may be in uh, a real down year. Really, you thought the same thing really about Auburn. Then they pop up and look like everybody expected them to do. We're talking about this game right here. What we saw last week as Auburn began to pull away and was really just hammering this Tennessee team. We saw a resolute Tennessee team in a veritable snake pit down at Auburn with all the noise and all the momentum going toward the Tigers, and they fought back. They uh, they got back in the game and had a chance to win at the end. That didn't happen tonight. And Coach Fulmer's going to have to address that with his squad. Very high kick. Boy, what is the hang time on this thing going to be for Colton? Just yeah. about straight up. For about 20 yards. Just 21 yards. 5.23 to go. A night to forget for Phil Fulmer and what was a packed house at Neyland Stadium. Not much to add to these faces. They tell the whole story from Tennessee tonight. Sports Center is coming up next, and uh, as we showed you, a little rundown of what they'll cover. There was a bean brawl in Boston. You're not going to believe what happened in that Pedro versus Clemens matchup and how Don Zimmer was involved. You have to see it. That's on Sports Center coming up now. So deeper and deeper into the depth chart go the Bulldogs. Ronnie Powell on this carry. Bill, I talked about the worst loss in the history of this series for Tennessee. 44 nothing at Athens 1981. Yeah. And if if my if my research is correct, the next game they played that year was the last time they lost to anybody by this many points. And that was USC in Los Angeles, September 12, 1981, 43 7. 
Unless I missed something along the way, I believe it has been that long since anybody beat Tennessee by this much. Yeah, this has been one of the top programs in the country. They just don't get beat like this. They're not at home. Powell losing yardage. Midnight. Nine Pacific tonight. Reese Davis, Trev Alberts, and Mark May will have college game day final. Wrap up of all the action and all the highlights from Separation Saturday. It's on ESPN. If you're on ESPN2, Sports Center will follow. A little over four minutes of game time. Third quarterback of the night in there now for Mark Rick, and it is redshirt freshman Joe Tarashinsky the third, whose father and grandfather played on Georgia SEC championship teams. His father now the strength coach for the Bulldogs. Let's check in with Matt Weiner. All right, Dave, USC moving the ball one more time. Lendale White gets the handoff. Six touchdown one of the year for him. The Trojans on separation Saturday have separated a little more. They're up 13-0. USC dropping to nine after it looked like they'd be a national championship threat. After the events of the day, though, it looks like everybody takes a back seat to that Oklahoma team that demolished Texas, 65-13, most points in the history of that series. 13-yard punt. Hunters have not had great nights. Well, what happens in a game like this is that virtually everybody loses focus. The walk-ons get a chance to get in the game, and, oh, Mom's so happy to see her son out there, but he doesn't know the plays. So you see people running into each other and not doing very well. The punter's sitting over there thinking, gee, I got to go back out there. And he doesn't pay attention to his base. It just happened to both of them. They don't drop the ball properly. They don't swing their legs properly. And they can get in bad habits. People can get hurt in games at times like this. There almost ought to be a rule that you could call a game off at a certain point. But we run don't rule. have such a thing. Yeah, run, base, baseball's run rule run sometimes, rule. sometimes not a bad idea for other sports. C.J. Leak. Had to throw under pressure from Dez Williams, a true freshman who backs up Odell Thurman, middle you, linebacker. Do you think Brian Van Gorder's not a competitor? He's still coming after him with the blitz. He doesn't want him to score any more points. He wants this to be essentially a shutout, especially in the second half. There's Brian. You think he's still in the game? Great defensive coaches only have one gear. He said something interesting this week. He says adjustments in game are overrated. We, we pay so much attention to this coaching staff made a great adjustment. Or what adjustments are they going to make at halftime? He says all that is very overrated, that preparation is much more important. Well, then Philip Fulmer said an interesting thing that sort of dovetails with what, what Van Gorder said to us. Phillips said, we study him, we don't get any tendencies. It's, it's as if he has a script of defenses, and he's just going to run them no matter what the situation is. So it doesn't really necessarily coincide with defenses you're accustomed to seeing in that scenario. So Van Gorder may call his defenses at random and expect them to execute all of them. Maybe that's what he means. Very interesting. Blitz on third and nine. Pass over the middle is complete, but not near first down yardage. As Joe Mo Fagan makes the catch. Here's what George, Georgia has the rest of the way. These five opponents are combined 11 and 16. Vandy, UAB, Florida, Kentucky at Georgia Tech. What they have looming November 15th, though, is Auburn. And that's the Auburn team that has suddenly kicked it into gear after their 0-2 start. Looked like they were going to go uh, the month of September and not even score a touchdown. Well, have they ever figured it out? Beating Tennessee last week and today knocking Arkansas from the ranks of the undefeated in Fayetteville. That pass thrown way behind C.J. Faden. Yeah, we had a corner blitz. <laughs> I'm telling you, Ben Gorder's practicing all his defenses here. Maybe he does just call them no matter what's going on in the game. One of the real outstanding young coaches in football. One more look. Baton still looking for that ball. Mark Rick, it is third year. SEC Coach of the Year last year, SEC Champions last year. He's come really close 
would you say to what Bob Stoops has done at Oklahoma? Oh, I think so. And I think, and I don't know Bob Stoops. I'm sure he's a fine person, but Mark Rick is a wonderful human being. He and his wife and their family are, make a marvelous story. We don't have time to get into it here, but um, he's done a great job. I spoke with him before the game, and he said it again, all I want to do is be a good influence on these young men, and he means that. Doing that and winning. And winning big. Riggs gets the carry. Sunday night football, Seattle, San Francisco. From the Emerald City tomorrow night on ESPN 8:30 Eastern. ESPN HD, high definition nationwide, and FL Primetime. Presented by Miller Lite at 7.30 Eastern. We'll get everything started, and then Niners Seahawks. If you're still in the mood for some football, if you just don't want your separation Saturday to end, may we recommend on ESPN <laughs> Ohio State at Wisconsin, that game in the third quarter. And Ohio State's 19-game win streak is uh, in some jeopardy. We'll fill you in a little more on that when we come back. as you would have thought. Leak trying to make it a little closer, and he does with a touchdown strike. Brett Smith, true freshman from Warren, Arkansas. That cannon has a kind of a pile of sound <laughs> for two reasons. Number one, because of the score on the scoreboard. Number two, because this stadium's virtually empty. We don't have all that body temperature and acoustical value. Nice scoring kick. The league's first passes of the season tonight. And he drives Tennessee down and with James Wilhoyt's extra point makes it 41-14. Teams like Tennessee, when they do go through something like this, invariably fight back. The only question is when. The coaches will be doing everything in their power to see that it's this very week. Brett Smith, number nine. Nice concentration. Board center coming up. All the highlights from Separation Saturday. And again, you have to see the Red Sox-Yankees highlights. You won't believe what uh, some inside pitching from Pedro Martinez and Roger Clemens turned into. Meanwhile, on ESPN, we have Wisconsin-Ohio State going on third quarter, and that is Wisconsin 7-3. Ohio State in another tight one, so you just can't get enough of your separation Saturday. Mike, flip over to ESPN. That one's still got a ways to go in the middle of the third quarter. Two weeks now, Tennessee has to prepare for Alabama. Traditional late October matchup with the tie. That will be, however, in Tuscaloosa. So is this a good time for a week off, or would you rather jump right back on the horse? Man, there's nothing good about this kind of whooping. There's nothing good about losing any time. But the way they lost last week was a valiant loss. In this case, they just got knocked around, didn't really fight back, didn't really make a move in the third quarter when they had a chance to get back in the game. And I'm sure that this will be a discouragement. And the extra time could be devoted to essentially a training camp. It just depends on how the coaches feel about the leadership or the lack of sin on this squad. Well, his daughter, at least, to uh, help ease the misery tonight. Meanwhile, for Georgia, they will be heavy favorites for next two games at Vanderbilt next Saturday, and then their homecoming game, the 25th, against UAB before the world's largest outdoor cocktail party in Jacksonville November 1st against Florida. Follow that up with Auburn at home, then Kentucky, and at Georgia Tech. This will be a team to watch. They will improve their ranking at least a couple of spots, you figure, and go to 5-1, and 3-1 and one in the conference. Tennessee will fall to four and two, two straight losses. Two and two in SEC play, only in the very first year of divisional play, 92, did a team with two losses win the East. 
Well, history says this wins it for Georgia. They're not done yet. Powell in a foot race. Chase down finally at the 32. 47 yards. They just don't know how to stop. Well, they've got all backups on the field. Nick Jones, a true center in there, a true freshman in there at center from Bowden, Georgia, did a nice job, got the ball up, made a block. Powell off and running, excited to get his chance to play in this football game. Nice job by Reggie Weeks, a sophomore backup right guard, pulled around, got a nice hit. These are moments that pay off when you really need these guys in case of injury in the future. Tennessee outgained by a three to one margin on the ground. That was what they worked all week on trying to fix. Powell for no gain. 187 on the ground for Georgia, just 61 for Tennessee. It's better than four last week, but not by much. And Mark Rick, the first Georgia coach to have a four game winning streak for the Bulldogs over the Volunteers. What was supposed to be a close game, anything but. From the final play of the first half on, the 94-yard fumble return by Sean Jones. Turns it around for Georgia. They went it 41 to 14. And Georgia in total control now of the SEC's Eastern Division. For Bill Curry, Heather Cox, our entire ESPN crew, Dave Barnett, Good night from Knoxville. Thank you for joining us today. The Bucks from Brooklyn, the Giants from New York have come down to the wire to where it is all or nothing. Twenty years from now, the fans will be talking about this afternoon's hero as yet unknown. But the man and the hour are about to meet. If there is a goat, his name will echo down the corridor of time. Ralph Franca from Mount Vernon, New York, is going on the mound to throw for the Brooklyn. Rifle Ralph, who wears his number 13, and will that be lucky for the Brooklyn Dodgers here at the door of disaster in the last half of the ninth inning? Boy, I'm telling you what they're going to say about this one, I don't know. Here is the Royal Scott, Bobby Trump, just dangerous as a great dame behind the meat counter. Before World War II, much of New York's baseball history was written by one team, the New York Yankees. The Giants had some success in the 20s and 30s, but the 1940s was a vast wasteland for the team from Manhattan. The Dodgers were just as inept. Before Brooklyn made an unexpected appearance in the 1941 series, it had been two decades since the team had played a game in October. But shortly after the Second World War, that changed, and New York City became the baseball capital of the world. Beginning in 1947, at least one of the three New York teams would appear in the World Series in 10 of the next 11 seasons. Unfortunately for Dodger and Giant fans, it was still that hated team in the Bronx that did most of the winning. The Yankees were sort of this elitist, corporate, pinstripe types. Their fans expected winning, didn't bother to learn much about baseball, and rare instances when the Yankees weren't winning, they weren't Yankee fans. Yankee fans I thought of as front runners, the kind of people who rooted for the government in an income tax suit. The Yankees were up there in the Bronx, up on a hill. You know, they were just cascading 
Yankees had ushers, had mittens. When they brought you down to a seat, you felt you had to wear a tie. Yankee Stadium was for tourists. Directly across the Harlem River from Yankee Stadium stood the Polo Grounds, the odd-shaped, run-down home of the New York Giants. I remember coming out of the subway. The stop was 155th Street and 8th Avenue, and there was this big green thing there, this big green edifice. And you're greeted by the smell, smoke, tar, cheap cigars. It was one of the worst places in the world to watch a ball game. For instance, if you sat out in right field, oftentimes you couldn't see the right fielder who was right below you, and you'd have to yell over to somebody, hey, what happened on that play? Where did the ball go? It felt as if the seats had never been changed. There was pigeon droppings on these old green wooden seats, and the facade of the polo grounds looked like it hadn't changed since 1908. We detested the polo grounds. The ride was interminable and it was this foreboding, dark place. We detested it. Far from uninviting, Brooklyn's Ebbets Field was a vibrant, intimate, charming park. A day at Ebbets was like a baseball carnival for both the Dodgers and their fans. You paid your 75 cents for the bleacher seat, or if you were really flush, the buck and a half for a grandstand seat. You were right on the field. You could lean against the fences and yell, hi, Jackie, hi, Pee Wee, hi, Duke, hi, Carl. I can stand on the mound. I hear guys talking to you real easy. It wasn't like they were yelling loud. This guy's just talking, hey, Oisk, hey, Oisk, draw it through his head. I mean, it was wonderful. It was one of the greatest places in the world for a comic to get his material. They were so funny, and they were so outlandishly brash. Different as they were, Dodger and Giant fans had one thing in common, an intense dislike for each other, passed down through generations of disdain. My father and I'd go over to Ebbets Field. It was almost like going into another world. One of the guards used to come down and sit behind us, because sometimes they'd throw things at us. <laughs> I would never go to the Polo Grounds. Never. Even when the Dodgers were playing, I hated the Polo Grounds. I hated the Giants. That was part of the fun, is to hate. The hate is as important as the loving. Well, you hated the Dodgers because you were a Giant fan, and that was the way it's supposed to be. To beat the Dodgers, it's something I lived off all winter long. If you were a Giant, you were hated. Sid Gordon, Jewish guy, grew up three blocks from Ebbets Field. Played for the Giants, we hated him. I would have rooted for the Red Russians over the Brooklyn Dodgers. All I wish for them were 14 inning games played in rain. They hated the Dodger fans and the borough of Brooklyn because in Brooklyn, we had more. We had the trolley car, we had the subway, we had plenty of kosher delicatessens, and we had 500 pool rooms. They were jealous. For instance, after the game, did they have a Nathan's to go to on Coney Island? No, no Nathan's for them. They didn't have a Coney Island. They had Orchard Beach. No comparison. No comparison. As the 51 season began, there was no comparison between the two teams. The famed Boys of Summer were in the early years of their historic run. 1951, the Dodgers had Hodges, Robinson, Reese, Cox. Still the best infield I've ever seen. And right field for real. Terrific ball play. Center field, Snyder, and a great team. And of course, Campanella back at the plate. And we had a good pitching staff. Newcomb, Preacher Rowe, Erskine. We felt we were the favorites and we should win. We had a good, we had a good ball club. Ralph Branca was one of those good Brooklyn pitchers. By 1951, Branca was already an established and popular Dodger, a 20-game winner at the age of 21, and a native New Yorker. My father's from Italy and my mother's from a small town in Hungary. And they met in New York City, east side of Harlem, got married, and then moved to Mount Vernon. It 
it was a mixed neighborhood. I mean, there was German family, Irish families, Jewish family, and about three black families. So we had the League of Nations on that block. My father had many jobs. He was a trolley car conductor. He had a barber shop. My mother, when you say housewife, she had no time for anything else. I mean, I'm one of 17. When I was growing up, there was 14 children alive. My sister died when I was 13, so it was 13 growing up. One of the reasons I wore number 13 when I got to Brooklyn. I went from baseball, to football, to basketball. I rooted for the Giants. Mel Ott and Carl Hubble were my heroes. And then I signed with the Dodgers, June 6, 1944, which is D-Day, and for me it was Dodger Day. And now June 11th, I was in the bullpen in the Polo Grounds, and they called me in, and I remember walking in from that bullpen. I mean, I walked, and I walked, and I walked, like I was walking on a treadmill. And believe it or not, I struck out the first three guys I faced. A tough, strong, hard-throwing right-hander with an explosive fastball. Branca won 53 games before his 24th birthday. But in 1951, Charlie Dressen, the Dodgers' new manager, moved Branca to the bullpen, where he spent the first month of Brooklyn's up-and-down season. They needed a starter, and I started against Robin Roberts in Philadelphia. I went seven innings, and it rained. And I went in, took a shower, got new oil on my arm, put on a new uniform, and I went out and got the last six guys out, so I pitched a complete game and beat Robin. And then I won like two to one, three to one, four to two, and all complete games. So I think that kind of stabilized the staff, and I think it turned the team around. By contrast, Leo DeRocher's Giants hadn't won the pennant since 1937. And while there was some hope following a strong finish in 1950, the 51 season began poorly. I used to keep a scrapbook out of the Daily News clips or Daily Mirror of each game. 1951, I started it with good intent in my heart. They came out of the gate and lost three straight to the Dodgers in the Polo Grounds. The Phillies came in and swept them. Then the Braves came in and knocked them off. And they had to go back to Ebbets Field. And the Dodgers took two out of the first three. And now we've lost 11 in a row. That was the end of my 1951 scrapbook. We all knew that something needed to happen to the Giants, uh, some new player, some new spark. That player was 20-year-old Willie Mays, whose boyish enthusiasm was a welcome change on the veteran Giants, as well as on the streets of New York. He was as much at home on 8th Avenue playing stickball, which he did with kids up in Harlem, as he was on a baseball diamond. A day game, they whipped me up at 9 o'clock. I go out and play about two or three innings with them, buy the ice cream for them. Actually, I learned how to hit the breaking ball because you had to bounce the ball and it would break, and I would hit it all the time. Not all the time, at least not right away. Mays found his first few weeks in the majors overwhelming, especially at the plate, where his batting average dipped to 0.43. Willie Mays, when he first joined the Giants, he just couldn't buy a base hit, was hitting an awful tough luck. And uh, one day I came in the clubhouse, Willie was sitting in front of his locker, and he looked up and he said, Mr. Leo, he says, I just can't do anything right. He says, I just can't buy a base hit. He says, I just can't help this club at all. And I said, that's all right, Willie. We brought you up here to play center field and you're gonna play center field. You're the center fielder in this ball club today, and you're gonna be the center fielder tomorrow and next week and next month. And I think that took him out of the slump, and uh, he did come on to, to hit quite well the balance of the way. When Willie would do something extraordinary, he would have a suit hanging in the locker next day, or half a dozen shirts, or a wristwatch, or something, to let him know, just keep on doing what you're doing. He got to the point where he got so much stuff, he started distributing it to us, the rest of the players in the clubhouse. We'd go over there and look and said, uh, you know, what, what do you got new? And he said, here, you can have this, you can have that. <laughs> While Mays's turnaround made him increasingly popular with his teammates and giant fans, it was a complication. Willie played center field, a position that belonged to a well-liked, established veteran. I knew that he must have been a great prospect because we had a great center fielder in Bobby Townsend. Bobby Townsend was not a rinky-dink. When I was told that uh, I'm going to be moved out of center field, I accepted that. 
I was brought up in a responsible way to do what I was told and follow instructions. Robert Brown Thompson was born in Glasgow, Scotland on October 25, 1923. I was the youngest of six kids, and my dad decided that America was the best place for his kids to grow up. There was a long waiting list to get over to this country, and he'd been on that list. Well, wouldn't you know it, my mother was expecting me when his name came up to come over, and he had this decision to make whether to stay there and help his wife and kids or go forward with his plan. Well, my dad did come over here on his own. He was a cabinet maker, and actually it took him two years before he was able to send for us to come over here. We landed, and off to Staten Island we went. My dad took the baseball, and would you believe it, he was a Dodger fan. <laughs> he rooted for the Dodgers. In youth leagues, Bobby excelled at baseball, but his days as a player would have been short-lived if not for his older brother, Jim. My brother was my mentor. He's the guy that bought me my first glove when he worked for Sears Roebuck, and he's the guy that had me out in the backyard when I was strong enough to hold a bat. When I first went away to play Class D ball out of high school, uh, I wasn't doing too well, and I guess he could tell by my letters, and he'd write to me and tell me to keep your chin up, keep hustling, and get mad, hit somebody sliding into second base. And after a lot of instructions, he signed, and he says, you're a severest critic, but most ardent admirer. And that, that kind of, ooh, that took hold of me. <laughs> He had a world of talent. He had power, he had speed. But he was just inconsistent. If you look at his record, he had a good year, bad year, good year, bad year. Unfortunately for both Thompson and the Giants, 51 was shaping up to be one of those bad years. At the end of April, the last place New Yorkers had only three wins. And while May and June saw some improvement, by mid-July, the Giants still trailed Jackie Robinson and the first-place Dodgers, a confident team led by the most confident of players. In 1951, Jackie Robinson was at his peak as both a player and as a controversial figure. He bats 338. He's the dominant player on the Dodger team. But he's also completely liberated himself. In 1947, Jackie was told by Mr. Vicky he was not to take part in any arguments on the field. He was to do as he's told. Well, in 1951, I called him in the office and said, Jackie, those days are over. You've had your probation now. Four years are up. Do what you want to do. It was payback time, and he was dishing it out verbally, physically, on the bases. It was a game in Boston that we played, and the Dodgers were winning at 11 to 3. And Jackie stole home with a big lead, and they got on his case. And when he started raising him, Jackie got back to the dugout, he turned around, patted his backside to a kiss to him. His voice had great carry to it, and that laugh, the, it was an irritating type laugh to the opposition. He would always holler something at Leo, because he didn't like Leo. And he and DeRocher would jaw back and forth and call each other every name in the book. They hit him with everything he could personal comments about Lorraine Day, who DeRocher had married. Jackie used to accuse Leo of wearing Lorraine's perfume. Robinson was up, and as Robinson was in there, DeRocher's bullhorn voice said, my dick to you, Robinson. And Robinson didn't step out of the batter's box, didn't lower his bat. He said, give it to Lorraine. She needs it more than I do. The tense interaction between Robinson and DeRocher was nothing new. In 1948, Leo had been Jackie's manager with the Dodgers two developed an intense dislike for each other. When the Dodgers swept free from the Giants in early August, their 12th win in 15 games between the teams, Brooklyn's lead grew to 12 and a half games, and Robinson's taunting grew even louder. Dressen was hiring a kite. He uh, 
gave his players the green light to do a little bit of taunting. And the two locker rooms are side by side. There used to be a door in between. So Dressen comes down and he says, come on back to the door. We want to sing. The Giants are dead. The Giants are dead. The Giants is dead. Some players didn't want to do it. Others did willingly. And you could hear one voice above everybody else. It was Jackie's. Eat your heart out, Leo. You'll be last before the season is over. This is something that just totally infuriated the Giants, and they didn't bang on the door back to them. They didn't yell. DeRosa just said, Fellas, he said, you hear what they're saying? Let's get our act together and go on out and show them what we can do. We're 13 and a half games ahead on August 13th. 13 and a half. It's a joke. I think the whole team felt we had it won. I mean, how good is a team going to go to catch it? We beat the Phillies two out of three. They beat the Braves three out of three. We'd win three out of four, they win four out of four. Spawn and Sane, Roberts and Simmons, we were beating everybody that they threw at us. The starting pitcher would get the lead of one run and somebody on the bench would say, okay, there's your lead, hold it. <laughs>